Welcome back, everyone, and good afternoon. I am Epimonte here at the NRG Series Championship. Uh, we got a little refreshed with some pizza, some pasta, a little bit of soda. All the players have done so as well. I wanted to take us through a journey about how we got to the point we're at. So what we're going to do is talk about the structure real quick of the tournament as we're getting ready to end to our fourth and final stage here. So there are four players still left in our tournament. We started off with round robin with all of our players being available into that. We said goodbye to some of those players in our double elimination second stage of Modern. Did the same thing in our double elimination stage of Pioneer, which brings us to our finals playoff here in stage four. And what that means is, is the top four and the finals are going to be best of three matches. So what that means is players are going to alternate format choice and play and draw choice, starting with the higher seed. Now, what I can tell you is both players that had the choice here chose to play Pioneer. Uh, so we will be playing a couple matches of Pioneer on camera here in just a few moments. I did want to tell you what the players are playing for because we haven't really talked about that too much other than the obvious championship. So you can see here the uh, the, the 12 players that have been eliminated from our tournament all listed there, uh, taken as around $400 to finish 16th and 15th, which was Joe Bernal and Derek Davis. You can see the rest of the players uh, and their prize payouts. Uh, the remaining four players going to at least walk away with $1,500. Second place going to walk away with $2,500 and a nice $5,000 payout for first place, whoever our champion is today. Now, for those four players, you might be wondering who's remaining. If you couldn't do the uh, subtraction yourself, don't worry. We got you covered here. I'm going to show you those top four players we do have remaining in just a second here. And you're going to have Andrew Ellenbogen, uh, Raja Suleiman, Jesse Robkin, and Zoe Reederman. I think you're going to hang out with Joe Lissette here in a little bit. And me and him are the only ones actually eliminated uh, from the picks. So three of the players that have been chosen are still in the top four. So good to the rest of our uh, my commentary colleagues for those choices. And uh, Zoe Riederman sneaking into the top four. Maybe a little underdog story. So good for her. All these players definitely mainstays here on the NRG series throughout the year. So great to see them getting ready to battle it out. And it sounds like to me the players are all set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you down to Joe and Drake Sasser, and they're going to get you started here in our top four playoff. All right. And we're thanks, diving Matt. right in. Yeah. yeah. And here we go. So, okay, Drake, you're here with me for the rest of the day. Morning, everybody that's been following along. We've got a top four quarterfinal match with, uh, okay, either my information is wrong or – we, I think we have a name incorrect. This is this is Jesse Robkin versus Andrew Ellenbogen. Oh, yeah. You can't mistake that rock there on the yeah. right anywhere. That's definitely Andrew Ellenbogen sitting in that seat. And, uh, you know, when you're down to this top four, you're looking at the best of the best players that, you know, are even on the energy series at all. You know, these the tournament itself is already the best of the best. We've eliminated, you know, oh, uh, careful there. 12 players. Yeah. And now we're down to the final four. And these players, you know, when you have the best of the best working together – it's very likely they're going to make it deep. Both of these players, a 75-card mirror. And so I think higher seed could end up mattering a lot, given that there's not a single card difference between these two deck lists. Yeah, so, okay, let's talk about that. So we have mono-white aggro humans here in Pioneer. Going first, obviously, significant if you can get on the board quickly. Andrew, not so much, though. Like, has he already lost the advantage from going first, not being able to attack here? Potentially. I think his turn two is a little bit underwhelming. We've seen this happen a few times with the mono white deck where, you know, if you have a one drop into one drop, one drop turn, Muta Vault does a lot to disrupt your mana development mm -hmm. in that case. And so here going one drop into just another one drop is much less exciting than say Jesse's turn two, which is Luminarch Aspirant. You could of course do that with Muta Vault, but obviously not something Andrew had exposure to and getting Luminarch Aspirant into play as soon as possible uh, starts beefing up the table. And yeah, we see Jesse already willing to get frisky with this hopeful initiate and, uh, yeah, I, no blocks from Andrew suggests potentially he has a way to beef up this team. Maybe something like a Thalia's Lieutenant involved in the mix. Does have land three either way, but there's a lot of cards in this mono white deck that reward you for just having creatures in play. So mm -hmm. trading, not usually something this mono white deck is excited to do. All right, so an attack in there for Andrew. And like, okay, here's a Thalia. So yeah, not, I mean, not coming with the power cards uh, for the matchup here. So I wonder, I mean, he obviously kept his hand. Well, actually, with two cards left, maybe he didn't keep a very big hand. Yeah. And uh, okay, Jesse oh, here wow. with a second Luminarch Aspirant. And this, so now the initial can start growing with training. And this is a lot of pressure here on Andrew. And yeah, Jesse's start certainly fairly impressive, although without a third land. 
Yeah, the land's not necessarily that relevant if your creatures are kind of already doing the work for you. You know, Luminarch Aspirant, much better than cards like Thalia, Guardian of Three, but in this matchup, mm -hmm. being able to grow your team every single turn, that's something you don't have to spend mana on. They just do it for you. So, Jesse, we see just flush full of, you know, great spells. I think we see Brutal Cathar, Brave the Elements. So this early damage that Jesse's getting across is going to end up mattering with a potential big Brave the Elements later on. And Andrew, looking to swing the tides a little bit, here comes a full attack. Now suddenly interested in trading with a lonely 1-1 one, one Aspirant left to block. Yeah, well, I mean, the Aspirant's obviously individually better than probably any of the cards on Andrew's side of the board over the long term, like you were saying. So maybe Jesse lets all this through and he's got to be sizing up, you know, how much time is it going to take before Jesse's able to kill Andrew with Brave the Elements? Moonvault playing a, a relevant role there as a potential blocker. but Yeah, that one, no, no color you can name to get through a yeah. Moonvault as that one is colorless. All right. Doing a little bit of thinking here. I, blocking, I feel like, can't be great. No. I mean, once again, Jesse, a little stuck on lands. And as I mentioned, Aspirant doing a lot to grow her field without any extra work. But the follow-up for Andrew is one of the better cards, I'd say, in this matchup. In Brutal Cathar, going to take care of the bigger Luminarch Aspirant. It's going to take a lot of wind out of Jesse's sails. Yeah, so definitely Andrew would have <clears throat> really hoping for a trade there as Jesse would have put herself pretty far behind, unexpectedly losing the second Aspirant. But she doesn't fall for that. So ma maintains one on the board. Maintains presence. Has a Brutal Cathar in hand of her own but without the land to cast it and i mean well we see the thalia there that's fairly unimpressive at this point this yeah, is a game already it's harder and harder to cast yeah. if she deploys her own then it's not even on the table at all to cast whereas like maybe it's time to start pumping the brakes look to block and use maybe the brave the elements to block also have the option of thalia's lieutenant try to grow the whole team and just keep that snowball of growing creatures going but mm -hmm. you know very quickly falling behind and I don't, I don't know that you're super excited to have a Brutal Cathar flip if you just choose to play nothing. So have to imagine yeah. Jesse's going to play something here. That almost doesn't even seem like an option to let the Brutal Cathar flip. I mean, Andrew with only one card in hand, maybe he doesn't turn back over right away. But yeah, it's this is tough. Now, I mean, 45 seconds ago, seemingly we were thinking, can Jesse brave, how close is she to brave the elements for the win? And now it's reversed on Andrew's side. Yeah, I maybe incorrectly analyzed a little bit that the, the land's not mattering too much. You do need your third one as Brutal Cathar, as I mentioned, one of the better cards for taking the wind out of your opponent's sails. And Jesse has no shortage of them, but does need her third land drop eventually to start casting them as she crashes across yet again for what looks to be seven. Big attack. Yeah, yeah seven coming across here. So uh, acknowledging that Prey of the Elements is going to beat her anyway. There's no reason to hold back all the blockers or even any that you can. And let's see, if Thalia's Lieutenant lines up a block on Andrew's biggest creature next turn, Jesse looks like she would probably survive. So yeah, this play, hoping there's another land in Andrew's hand, this may get her in the driver's seat. I don't know. This is tough to call. Yeah, I think with Jesse missing land drops, she's accepting, okay, I can't beat just everything, right? Like yeah. if you have, I'm going to lose to some subset of cards, basically no matter what, this is playing to win, not deploying the Thalia, all that kind of stuff. Brave the Elements is on the table to just kill Andrew next turn. So provided Andrew's hand is a little bit weak, which is something she needs to have in order to win this game, given that she stumbled, she is setting up a play to win. This, I mean, really shows quite a mastery from both of these players. I mean, we've talked endlessly about Andrew winning his Pro Tour uh, with a mono white aggro strategy. And Jesse, you know, been playing mono white all season we've seen her dispatch of many many a strong opponent with the same deck got to work with andrew so now knows all the tricks of the trade uh we're gonna see some really tight play and i really like what we've seen from both of these players andrew kind of looking somewhat ahead going into this turn mm -hmm. uh but could the game could be stolen by that powerful brave the elements we know jesse has well yeah and so and from andrew's perspective you're looking at the sport <clears throat> can you lose to anything besides brave the elements and i feel yeah, like the answer is probably no so again, there's another incentive to continue attacking because just blocking in this matchup is, you know, somewhat at the, you're somewhat at the mercy of your opponent deciding whether you can block or not. Yeah, a Brave the Elements immediately could just take blocking off the table, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of any cards that care about you keeping creatures in play, things like Adeline and Thali's Lieutenant and the like. Uh, so you're blocking despite all of the creatures you would expect a lot of attacking and blocking you see a lot of attacking not so much blocking but a few and we've seen this so far in this game alone a few critical blocks can make a big difference even just getting a single block off can get you those valuable life points you need to be able to get that final attack in and win the game as we see mm -hmm. mutavault maybe being fired up here all right it's an all-out assault here for andrew gonna force a block and then presumably yeah, play a creature's corners. second uh second main and hope it's able to get the job done 
But we well, know that's trading with, I think the only thing it can, so mm -hmm. a reasonable block there, but has to block because that was a, an attack for 10. A follow-up Brutal Cathar would be brutal. And it is not. It is Extraction <laughs> Specialist, but I think, I think Brave Elms is just dead. And yeah, Jesse, yeah. upkeep, snap it off. Look, you're dead to this. Okay, draw. All right, fine. Bonk. And that is one dead. Andrew, didn't you wow. want to counter on it? Look, you're dead. You're dead. Go away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so Jesse Robkin picks up the first game, but... Her pledge to play the most accurate tournament of her life. She missed the counter there. It's over. Whatever, the, Joe. That yeah. literally <laughs> could not matter. Thalia in play. Things absolutely don't matter. Fine. I'll actually turn my creature sideways for the camera. And Jesse able to steal. I, I say mm -hmm. steal, but like, you know, Andrew on the play had a powerful turn. Every turn, it seemed like, you know, each player was able to switch the favor towards them and mm -hmm. jesse as we mentioned did play to win got rewarded by winning that first game and i think that's an important one to win in this match and is going to do a lot to dictate the rest of the texture of this you know potentially three match series right. you know we're, we're not one match doesn't decide who advances it takes two out of three matches to to decide who advances first two matches is going to win this one and i think that's an important game to win for jesse yeah i mean stealing on on the draw is pretty big all right let's go ahead and bring up the deck list <laughs> remember 70 same 75 both players so it's the yeah. same deck both players how are we sideboarding yeah so you see there the uh some of the unique choices like extraction specialist not in the stock build not every build uh not the full set of brutal cathars main deck they are the remaining ones are in the sideboard where i'm surely going to see those come in uh wedding announcements likely to join in in order to be able to go wide and just provide you know staying power grinding power so the harder question is what do you not like not in love with Thalia's. I mean, that card right. doesn't seem like it is the best thing you could be doing on turn two. I mean, look at the, you know, double one drop is usually better. Thalia's Lieutenant, Luminar Grasper, all way more impactful to shifting what's going on on board than Thalia mm -hmm. Guardian of Thraven. So I'd imagine we're going to trim a little bit on that angle. Otherwise, you know, there's not a ton else I think you want to get rid of. Maybe you shave some of your one drops on the draw if you need to play more of a reactive game. We've seen this in aggro mirrors across Magic's history where the aggro player on the draw has to take a little bit more of a control role. They can't necessarily rely on just being able to come out the gate harder than their opponent because it is literally a 75 card mirror. So mm -hmm. maybe we see some of the, the worse at blocking one drops trimmed. Uh, maybe some of the Savannah Lions type effects. R recruitment officer is the one I'm looking at, I guess. Uh, but... Overall, I would expect, even if there's some play draw shifts, it's still not going to be dramatic. You know, maybe one yeah. or two of the one drops get shifted for some removal spells that you otherwise wouldn't have in your deck. I mean, you're cutting a land when you're going second here. If you, if you think you end up in a longer game, if you think uh, you can get away with it, that's one way to potentially have a denser deck later on. I mean, there's all kinds of small edges here. However, both players likely be doing the same thing as they prepared for the event together. Yeah, I have to imagine they, they did come up with a plan for themselves. I mean, mm -hmm. Mono White, a certainly prevalent deck in uh, Pioneer and has been since. I mean, we saw it really do well in the regional championships earlier last year. Mm -hmm. um, and really, it's just been a mainstay of the Pioneer format since. Jesse, you know, like I said, done a lot of winning on the NRG series uh, to qualify for this event with Mono White. So these players, no, no stranger to the deck. I'm sure they had a plan even before they started preparing together and uh, definitely probably converged that plan and likely sideboarding the exact same play draw may change. But, you know, either way, they're aware of each other's plan going into this. All right, so players still shuffling up. Here we go. Uh, if you're just joining in, this is going to be best two out of three matches. So still best two out of three games for this Pioneer match. And then we will shift, and it will be – this was uh, Andrew on the higher seed. So Jesse would have the choice uh, next, although, again, playing 75 Mirror in both formats, it's – whatever format I guess they're more comfortable – more comfortable with is what we're likely to see is there's no edge to be really gained matchup wise either way well i was talking to well i say talking to it was more of a twitter exchange uh i saw a twitter exchange with jesse where she was mentioning that likely she's going to have to on the play choose pioneer and mono white again because being on the play with mono white is the mm -hmm. biggest advantage in these kinds of mirrors that you can get Right, being able to come out the gate strong, kill your opponent, snowball the game. It's just something Mono White's very good at. So being on the play specifically is something very powerful for Mono White. Being mm -hmm. on the draw in the breach mirror doesn't matter as much. Play draw matters less in that matchup. So whenever the players have a choice, I believe for this particular set, I think both players that are on the play are going to choose specifically Pioneer and uh, the play, obviously, so that they can be on the play with Mono White. Mm -hmm. Well, that that uh, bodes poorly for Andrew Ellenbogen here, having already lost 
game exactly right on like, play, <laughs> that's yeah. what I was talking about earlier if that's the biggest advantage and he more or less just lost it then I have to feel like Jesse has to be really excited even though I mean this is a potential three match series and that's one game I think she's really excited to win that one because it was sure. one that was probably the most likely of any given one for Andrew to win all right, so Andrew with no one drop this time. Moonrock Aspirant, that's great. Well, that's out of here. Easily taken care of for one yeah. mana, no less, and a one mana follow-up. A great start for Jesse once again. Yeah, this is uh, – Andrew's kind of getting uh, – falling behind both games in the early couple turns here, even though he fought back in game th one and looked like he had chances. Here uh, – okay, well, we're going to need a third land. Do we have it? Uh, the answer appears to be no. Well, that didn't matter for Jesse last time. That's but Jesse true. Jesse also had two white sources, which we've come, we've just come up multiple times across the weekend. The Mutant Vault's very powerful, but certainly not without cost, as we see Andrew considering what two mana spell he wants to play. It'll be another Luminarch Aspirant. All right, all right. That's something that, that does mean that Jesse can probably just attack through here. Andrew unlikely to be willing to trade off his better creature just for a 2-1. Once again, hemorrhaging very valuable life totals. You know, Brave the Elements mm -hmm. always on the horizon for stealing right. a game. And if this is Adeline, oh, wow. Oh, boy. Okay, well, here comes a 1-1. One, one. Have to be excited to block that one. But 4 damage still going to come through. And Adeline, still a very large girl, There is the resplendent Cathar. Yeah, there we go. Get a good look at that one. Vigilance, X4 to start with. That X is going to be 3 because it cares about the number of creatures you have in play. One of those you know, cards that kind of disincentivizes trading because you, you want it to be as big as possible because it gets to just rumble. Rumble in. Vigilance means no tapping, so it can do attacking and blocking. It is usually the biggest thing going on on the battlefield in these kinds of model white setups. Yeah, this card is a house. It's so it just puts out so much damage and it's so large. And we'll see. I don't know, Andrew. Removal spell. Okay, third land found. Uh, is that declaration? Okay, declaration, declaration takes out stone. Yeah, wow. Okay, that's that's good. Um, definitely gonna need that counter on that lunar aspirant. So you know, three three is much more able to block these these little bodyguards. True. Does tie up a lot of I Andrew's get... turn, though. Okay, yeah, wow. Attack for two. Yeah, nice. Aggressive. So it puts the counter on the 2 3 blockers just as good at handling the two ones as a 3 3 aspirant would be, and able to push through two damage here. So nice turn there for Andrew. Doesn't look like Jesse is uh, going to be pumping the brakes anytime soon. I think we have potential to do fourth land, play another one drop in the form of recruitment officer and uh, brutal cathar, which would be a pretty nasty turn. The thing is, you want to you want to get in damage, which involves getting the hopeful initiate out of the way. But mm -hmm. the card that is the best card on Andrew's battlefield is the tap luminarch aspirant. So you kind of have to choose what angle you want to take as far as removing the best thing or pushing damage. With which how how high Andrew's life total is, pushing damage could be a bit risky. Oh, or we could just yeah. have two removal spells as there is portable hole to take care of the hopeful initiate. Yeah, I mean, you say, I mean, you say Andrew's life total is high, but it's, it's dropping. I mean, not in huge chunks, but for a turn is, you know, adding up and half of it's gone now. We're, we'll see when we get to the point where a, a one shot from Brave the Elements becomes possible. We're not there yet. Definitely not there yet, but Jesse definitely snowballing the advantage. A lot of removal spells. And this is something we called out during the sideboard games. There's going to be a lot more removal, uh, removal spells involved. So the interaction going to be cranked up quite a bit. And we're going to see the games actually slow down pretty dramatically as a result. Players are going to have less pressure because they're looking at removal spells in their hand. And creatures that do interplay are more likely to get removed from the battlefield. So individual card quality begins to matter a little bit more. And actually, mm -hmm. I think that's an argument for keeping these recruitment officers uh, in your deck. Because they can provide a little bit of extra value as the game goes along. Yeah, I'm interested to see if we actually see one activate at some point during this weekend. I don't know that we have yet. There was an opportunity yesterday, but it didn't happen. Uh, as the player just attacked to the win instead, unfortunately. People, Unlucky, some people really. don't understand priorities, man. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're one of those, those dirty control players that would rather take <laughs> game actions than ever win the game. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe that's true. Maybe that's not. But uh, yeah, anyway, we haven't seen one yet. Or at least I haven't seen one yet in, in my rounds. A well, second Jesse's too far from it. She does have a card yeah. that she's liable to crack here, I think. Mm -hmm. Has a Brutal Cathar, but after that, her hand's kind of out of gas as Andrew adds a Thalia's Lieutenant to grow the Luminarch Aspirant. wonder if we're going to spread out counters here or just try to make this Luminarch Aspirant as tall as possible. Looks like we did just put it on the, the Thalia's Lieutenant as we go back to Jesse, who did crack the clue from the Declaration in Stone, and it uh, looks like she drew a few good ones. I think that's another Brutal Cathar and a Thalia's Lieutenant, all of which excellent cards in this spot. Yeah, you, Lieutenant, certainly, I mean, three creatures on the board, plenty to make Lieutenant powerful. Uh, let's see, so Cathar Lieutenant, what do you like here? If I mean, there's still the, the other move vault left to block, although it does trade off with any one of Jesse's creatures, so that may be a trade that either player is willing to make, especially on Jesse's side, clearing out the colorless creatures. 
Yeah, I like using my better. mana efficiently. I think mm -hmm. I want to deploy the first Brutal Cathar here. We have a backup in case there is something really scary like an Adeline. And we can, yeah, we can go ahead and get rid of this snowballing card. That leaves Andrew kind of low on gas. You know, all of his cards left aren't really, you know, getting better on their own like cards like Adeline and uh, Luminarch Aspirant do, where they just kind of create extra advantage without you really having to do any more work. All those cards kind of being checked is, I think, a big part of this Mono White Mirror. Just to try to slow down the uh, the gas pedal from Andrew Ellen Bogan and eventually flip the script and move towards actually winning the game. Although Jesse has had a good enough draw that she's just been applying pressure the whole time anyways. We see another attack here for six. And Andrew definitely interested in doing some blocking. Yeah, being able to trade this Munivold off is probably beneficial. So you don't want to just hold mana up for it every single turn. Trading is really, with more cards in hand, anything you can trade off is probably good, right? Yeah, I think so. And especially being behind on life total, you need to just preserve your life total and hope to draw out of the problem. Like you, uh, Andrew just was able to exchange a land for a creature. I think that's going to be a good exchange provided the game can go on longer. And Brutal Cathar, the perfect card to help with that as it takes care of that first Brutal Cathar and uh, Luminarch Aspirant going to return to play. We'll see where he wants to put the counter. I think Brutal Cathar already a juicy target to be removed anyway. So yeah, yeah, I think we're supposed to put it on the Aspirant as we go back to Jesse, who we know has another Brutal Cathar. So we just Cathar to Cathar to Cathar, everything. We're Catharing everything. It's all gone. Doesn't Nothing matters. Well, these Cathars have a, a habit of jumping. I mean, I guess, well, yeah, we'll see what, how likely they are to eventually trade off in combat. And maybe never if these players have their say about it. All right, here's another Adeline. Okay. Yeah, that's, another Adeline. Yeah. We had the choice of Brutal Cathar here. Instead chose to Adeline, and I think that's a sign of strength. It's saying, all right, I'm already ahead on life total. I think I'm still ahead on board. So I'm going to get my snowballing advantage card going and keep the pressure on your life total while, you know, I still have this Brutal Cathar in the tank for any scary thing you can play. At any time, I can just Cathar your Cathar and mm -hmm. then get my other Cathar back and just kill two of your things uh, right there. So just keeping that in the tank, continuing to apply pressure with Adeline, I think definitely shows Jess, Jesse's confidence in her uh, board position at the moment. No shortage of lands drawn by both players. Right. So let's see. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that these Adeline tokens so far are just getting picked off immediately in combat. So no way to build up the go wide board presence. No one's drawn wedding announcements. So Adeline is, is actually fairly small. For this late yeah, game, only usually, a two four. It does yeah. still have a lot of toughness. The so blocking is still very good with mm -hmm. the Adeline. You know, it checks you know a, a, a creature and does reduce the uh, ability of Andrew to start to flip the script and turn the corner as far as life total goes. I and mean, you look at this life total difference. Sometimes that doesn't matter as much in games of Magic, and that's kind of I guess one of the more confusing things about Magic is life total is not always indicative of who's winning. But in this mm -hmm. case, it, it matters quite a bit. You know, yeah. when we're dealing with attacking, blocking creatures, and every life point mattering, uh, I think those life totals is something that Andrew certainly has to consider when trying to eventually start attacking because we're not winning this game if we don't start doing some attacking. And Brutal Cathar interested in getting in there. Yeah, so this does this represent Iganjo? I think that's a bluff of Iganjo. I didn't see one yeah. in his hand. It may, it may just be a bluff. I can't actually tell. And there's Brutal Cathar follow-up is going to go ahead and take care of the Adeline as we got two points in. Could have done that beforehand. Right. Goes to attack first, selling potentially an Iganjo. I love it. I love it. That's so sick. So, <laughs> yeah, that was if that was a bluff, then, I mean, it's pretty convincing. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was Jesse supposed to do. Yeah. And Brutal Cathar of Jesse's own going to come back. And this is about to uh, flip yeah, the board wow. dramatically. And I think this game may have just been about who is the last person to deploy Brutal Cathar. As we see, you know, the Brutal wow. Cathar, eat a Brutal Cathar, eat a Brutal Cathar, and then comes back uh, with Adeline. And the Thalia's Lieutenant follow-up is going to grow her board. And suddenly this looks completely lopsided. Oh, my goodness. What a turn. All right. Jesse empty-handed. Andrew untapping. Uh... All right, you got have, to, uh, a good one. I think it has to be specifically a removal spell. Mm -hmm. He already did sell an Iganjo, so that may add some complications to attacking and blocking. But no attacks there from Andrew. And passing the turn back, Jesse takes a draw step. If Andrew's at three, I mean, I, I don't know what we're doing here. Chefnet Dunes crack it. Let's go. It's go time. Yeah. Oh, I mean, oh, oh, sure. Our, sure. We have our brutes too. Why not? <laughs> right. And then with Adeline with a to with a token on it, so it can't even die to Iganjo if that is in fact what Andrew's other card is. 
So the consideration is if you can't attack with your brutes, right? Because mm-hmm. he's sold that there's Naiganjo and clearing the brutal cathars would be a huge problem. Yeah, okay. Well, this probably just changes that entirely, where it's just okay, everything, plenty of lethal threats. It's like the question is, is it still lethal if you say I can't attack with my brutes to play around an Iganjo? And I think the answer now is yeah, just nothing matters. You can just attack with everything. As we see. Yeah. Yep. Adeline's vigilance. Sure, that grows the things more because a human does enter. And now, even if he does have the Iganjo, I think we're still getting a three-power creature through. And Andrew going to scoop him up. And Jesse wins the first match very convincingly. Now, of course, it is not over. But what a dominating performance from Jesse Robkin in the uh, first match where she did not get to pick the format. She did not get to pick play draw and was able to very quickly and cleanly 2-0 her teammate for this tournament, Andrew Ellenbogen. Yeah, okay. Now, so from Ellenbogen's perspective, or actually... Um... Let's go. Um, what format are we playing next? What, who who has uh, choice now? Is it this? It's the second player. So which would be it's Jesse? The second right? player. So Andrew yeah, has so choice Jesse. of play draw and right. format there. So yeah, now and Jesse lost. will have the so choice. So Jesse has choice and and priority. So I mean, you mm-hmm. said uh, she uh, referenced the fact that going first pioneer was that was the right way to go. So. I mean, we saw Andrew I think we're likely to first. see. Yeah, I think we're yeah. likely to see another mono white mirror this time with Jesse starting on the play. And I mean, if her performance looks anything like that one, this could be a quick 2 0 sweep could. in these matches uh, in just mono white mirrors alone. And, you know, I don't know, you know, if you're the if you're the self proclaimed mono white Pro Tour champion, as we know Andrew Ellen Bogan to well, be, well, I want does, well, this, does this harm your hubris a little bit? Or are you satisfied that you've given the secrets to a worthy opponent? Can you be a self proclaimed Pro Tour champion? Is I that mean, how he is a works? pro tour champion? That's true. The mono with, white is. The, I agree with the that part, there. but I mean, <laughs> self-proclaimed. That's. I mean, some people make a lot of claims, but like that, like pro tour champ. You can't. Like, I can't be a self-proclaimed Olympic medalist. That's not how it works. Sure, you you can claim that. You yeah. are allowed to claim that. It I just may guess. not be true. I mean, you yeah, you run in different circles than I do. I don't know. There's different levels of boasting that's like tolerable, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, okay, self-proclaimed Pro Tour champion, so says Drake Sasser. Andrew, if you're watching this back, I acknowledge that you actually are a Pro Tour champion. Drake, this, Drake this may is, not. This is semantics, but, uh, Joe. You're what? kidding me on semantics. Yes, of I'm course. excited to see high-level magic either way, even if it involves mono-white creatures. Not normally my style. I prefer is it's in spells and blue and red, no white, please. But, you know, mono-white creatures, this stuff's, you know, definitely masterful. I think aggro decks in magic as a whole get a little bit disrespected as far as I their agree. difficulty goes. And so everyone's like, blah, blah, blah. And they just want to excuse losing to them all the time because if you <laughs> face down either of these opponents in the out in the wild in one of our NRG series tournaments next year, this year, whenever – you are going to lose. I'm here to tell you that right now. I don't care who you are in the comments. It can be anybody. If you're in chat right now, you play either of these opponents piloting a mono white aggressive deck, you are going to lose. These players are that good. And, you know, it, it's a skill difference. Don't don't think they got lucky. They did not. They beat you. So, you know, to see these two juggernauts face it off here in the top four as we are playing for quite a bit of money, maybe we can get that slide up and see exactly what these players are playing for. Remember, it's best two out of three matches. Normally, you could just win two matches through the top four, then the finals, then go home. Absolutely not here. This is best two out of three matches. And we see these players locked in $1,500. Advancing to the finals gets you a minimum of an extra $1,000. You see second place there getting $2,500. But first place gets you upgraded all the way to $5,000. And you know a $20,000 prize pool for this small of a tournament is some high, high equity. There is a lot of money on the line. And of course, a very all-important invite to next year's uh, championship event just on the house. These players all worked extremely hard to get where they are today. Getting another invite is maybe even worth more than the money to these players who are, can easily spend that playing tournaments and you know winning money and what have you. No, yeah, and yeah, yeah the re-invite, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's such a big deal. I mean, having to just not prioritize, you know, how you're, all your finishes. I'm sure a lot of these players throughout the year were just like, okay, what do I have to do to get into the championship at the end of the year? I mean, you could still come play all the events, but it's just more relaxing. It's less stressful yeah. knowing that the invite's already locked up. Um, I had that. I had that privilege once uh, in the in the SCG version of these events, and it was it was just super super comforting knowing that um, that you didn't have to perform in any individual event. It was just less stressful. All right, let's talk about next year. Let's talk about if you want to play on the Energy Series next year. If you're enjoying what you're seeing, if you want to try and get into this championship, you can see there we are, January fourteenth, fifteenth. That's right now. The 20K championship, uh, same style of next year. First three events of this year, uh, two in Chicagoland or in Mundelein, Illinois. That's kind of like the home base. 
uh, March 25th and 26th and June 24th and 25th. And then also in Minneapolis uh, in late May 20th, 21st. So those are the first three events on the schedule. Formats will be announced close to that. You can expect the uh, the first formats to be announced fairly soon in the next couple of weeks, I'm sure. But uh, that's where you want to be. And if you're just enjoying the content, you, you can't make it out to play. Perhaps you you know live on the other side of the planet and you can't justify <laughs> the flight to play the energy events. No problem. We'll be here live bringing you the coverage every weekend. Drake, Absolutely. this is exciting stuff. You played in an event like this. Uh, we both played in the same one uh, in 2019. How did you feel like preparing for this event differed from, let's say, a normal event that you would just attend? Was there anything like anything struck you as different that you took away from it? Absolutely. I mean, preparing for these events is unlike any other. You know, normally you're looking, you're playing Magic Online against random opponents. You're looking at metagame breakdowns, you know, all that kind of stuff. When you are preparing for such a small field, especially these players that you've played against all year, there's a lot of reps back and forth. You know, you know how these players play. These aren't even random opponents. You know, you know exactly what kind of strategies these players have been playing. You've played against them before. Like, I'm sure there's no shortage of familiarity between all of our competitors. You can start to predict a very concise metagame mm -hmm. and you can start to uh, you know, work with some of the players that, you know, you feel like you're going to be able to leverage as far as getting into the, uh, getting into like this event. Like we saw, right. Jesse and Andrew working together. When I played the 2019 players championship along you, alongside you, I worked with Zach Allen, who was also in this event. Mm -hmm. So that shows how great he is. I think that was a good choice. And Harlan Fearer. And so preparing with other people gives you insight into some of the decks that are going to be there because you're working with them, but also like, gives you another person to bounce ideas off of, and you just have one of the best possible testing partners for the event. It's completely different. You can spend a lot more time doing productive testing because you know the kinds of decks you're going to be up against. It's really cool. And we've seen some players make some somewhat, sometimes questionable, sometimes bold and rewarding choices with their mm -hmm. deck building coming into this weekend uh, across the board. And, and that's what makes these events so special and so, so cool. All right. So, Drake, we have some news from the table. Okay. Modern is going to be the second format. Okay. All right. All right. So let's go ahead and bring up the modern deck list. Uh, I'm not going to get tired of saying that, by the way, that they're <laughs> singular. So the Team Root Breach deck will bring up Andrew Ellen Bogan's copy. Jesse's is identical. And uh, so this is an example of what you're talking about, working on an event, coming up with something that's not quite the same. Uh, Jesse, uh, well, well known for playing the Jeskai Breach deck all year in Modern. Uh, Team of Breach, the choice here, giving up Teferi for Ren and Six is one of the more significant changes in the deck list. What, what do we feel about this? Oh, I like it a lot, Joe. I mean, we were talking so much about Andrew and his mono white mastery and giving all the secrets to Jesse. This is where Jesse gets to give all the secrets to Andrew. Jesse, no, you know, it's those, if you're familiar with modern at all, Jesse is the Breach master. She has done a ton of work with her grinding station breach strategies in the modern format and has said over and over again that Urza's Saga is a big piece of the glue that makes this deck work. So including the powerful Ren and Six, you know, multiple calls for that card to be banned, I think, in modern from various mm -hmm. sources. It, it, either way, we know it's powerful. Being able to pick back your saga, pick back up your sagas and just have that plan just slam the door on games, I think is a big upgrade for this deck. And of course, you know, Red and Six can pick off small creatures that are problematic and all that what have you. So this deck now has a much more powerful, fair game plan uh, that can help supplement the, the combo win condition that happens once enough things have gone to the graveyard and all that what have you. Underworld Breach, of course, the deck, the card the deck is named after does allow you to kind of pick either mode. You can either get a ton of card advantage by putting all your cards back into play, or you could just straight up combo with some grinding stations on the spot and win the game. So a lot of cool angles this deck can take. And Jesse certainly the master. And I think maybe that's what made her pick modern here is her mastery of this deck. And this specifically this deck list on the play, being able to, uh, you know, kind of put Andrew into turf. He's a little more unfamiliar with, but of course has done no shortage of winning with it this weekend so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I, I like to clue in on the, on the choice, the, the choice of win condition changed. I mean, it's, Grape Shot could have been played in the Jeskai version, obviously. Instead, Tassel's Oracle was played. So are the Jeskai versions playing the wrong kill condition? Or is this, you know, something that might get paid off because of the format, because of what you expect to play against? Um, let's go ahead and get the uh, archetypes listed on the screen updated there. We are playing Modern, so we are not playing White anymore. We are playing the Team, team of Breach, Breach deck here. and Andrew yep. consulting six card hand. So we didn't see the mulligans in game one of Pioneer, but it looked like Andrew might have been down a card. And he is again 
going to begin the format short one, but that's nothing that you can't overcome. Absolutely. And I, I do think that we are looking at grape shot still as the ki kill condition, which I yeah. do like a lot uh, as far as being able to function as a reasonable card. We've seen this happen. I mean, I played a lot of Gift Storm in Modern, so that's kind of where my familiarity with grape shot comes from. And part of the power of grape shot as a win condition is that not only is it winning the game, but also it just works as a real magic card. There's mm -hmm. no shortage of creatures that you can just kill by going like turn two, okay, bobble, grape shot your, your X2 or whatever, or just right. try to grape shot a bunch of X1s, you know, that kind of thing. Grape shot works as a real magic card. And so when blocking and attacking doesn't matter as much, uh, Grave Shot, both easier to cast than Athos's Oracle, and it's just going to get the job done the same way the majority of the time. Yeah, we actually saw it through cast Grave Shot. Non, we didn't see it combo killed yesterday evening, but we saw Grave Shot cast for value three times. Yeah, uh, great. and each time, I mean, just doing some. I mean, with the, with the free spells in the deck, yeah, it can it can just do. I mean, we never saw it do anything spectacular, but it's something. And like, like you're it's saying, kind of a blank cardboard, which right. is what a lot of combo yeah. kill conditions end up being, right? Yes, and that's, that's where true. you see these these fair combo decks come from, right? When your combo pieces can function as fair cards, your deck becomes more powerful by being able to glue in some fair components and start to pivot between the game plans. Mm -hmm. All right. So, no, the, I mean, the key, the ideal one drop is Ragavan, basically every deck that has it. Jesse doesn't have one, but puts a stomping ground in untapped. Uh, certainly threatening, and then also not cracking the bobble. Uh, then maybe that suggests Emery. Maybe it says, "Okay, I have a removal spell just in case you have uh, Ragged Man, so don't even try it." <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. Could also just be holding for the information. If we, you know, there's no cards that you could possibly draw yet. You could also just want to the game to develop a little bit, get a little more information. Plus, like you mentioned, Emery, a reasonable card to call out. Jesse draws an Emery, then second land Emery is able to be played with that bobble allowing for a little bit of cost reduction as Andrew leads off on just a spring leaf drum and the passing of the turn. Both players you see, Giganthas, off to the side in the mm -hmm. companion zone. Once again, it is a 70 for 75 card mirror, so they both do have access to that as the game progresses. Easy to forget about that one. And if you're just joining us, if you look at the bottom between the players, that 1-0 record between Jesse is specifically for this series. We are in the top four. These players playing for their slot in the finals, best two out of three matches, and Jesse finds herself up a match right here as we begin game number one of the second match, now playing Modern. So Jesse has a very combo-oriented hand with Underworld Breach and Grinding Station in the hand and no board presence at all, but that may not be a problem. Uh, although yeah. Andrew does have the Haywire Might. I think both players looking at a ton of removal spells, so yeah. any kind of creatures that are going to be deployed here likely not going to stick around for a long time. And I think both players have to understand that that's part of what this matchup is about. Cards like mm -hmm. Ragavan, not as good, very easy to kill. And the, the cards that maybe matter a little bit more are things like the Ren and Six, as we see Andrew does deploy the Haywire Might, a card somewhat weak to Ren and Six. Uh, but if you look at it there, uh, gains two life, gives you a little bit of life back, but also exiles a non-creature artifact or non-creature enchantment. So that can do a good job getting rid of early played uh, grinding stations. It can get rid of a underworld breach mid combo. So that card mm -hmm. is going to be kind of a problem. And we see Jesse right away, unholy heat, put that one in the graveyard. No, thank you. None of that. It also represents a little bit of mana, of course, on Andrew's board because of spring leaf drum. So likely just good enough. Jesse willing to go ahead and fire off the breach to get rid of that one. So Jesse here fetching and leaving the mistress bubble on the board. So she clearly wants that on the board as you would often see Bobble, check your top card, whether you see you want to fetch or not, to to adjust the top of the deck, at least get some selection. But Jesse would prefer keeping it in play, wanting to potentially have an artifact to sacrifice to maybe Grinding Station, but really it's probably just in case an Emery's drawn. Or maybe yeah, it's for it a lot of things, right? It yeah. grows the grows the constructs yeah. that can be made off this saga. I think we're going to see her play here in a second. And it also indicates that, like, there's no rush. Mm -hmm. She does not expect this game to end quickly. She doesn't need the card to try to power out a combo kill. There's no rush here. Yeah. So we see Grinding Station put in the yard and three cards going to the graveyard, getting ready to breach. I think this definitely signals that there's a breach in her hand. Absolutely. I mean, cashing in that bobble for a card is something that we see on the regular. And sacrificing it to just mill three cards is really much a, really a departure, which... I don't think this is, you know, this is a random error. I think this is Jesse Robkin having a plan in mind, knowing what she wants to do and building the graveyard up being prioritized over cards drawn. Here's a ragged man that connects, finds a bobble, which, well, I mean, that's sort of great, good for Andrew. We'll get him a card if he wants it, but it also puts another bobble, another card in Jesse's graveyard. 
Yeah, that's definitely true. Putting more cards in graveyard seems to be something Jesse wants to do. So right. if you're Andrew, kind of the question becomes, how do you check this breach that I think is kind of somewhat face up in Jesse's hand? Mm-hmm. And it, or at least that's kind of her plan, even if she doesn't have one yet. But like, I think both removing the Haywire might aggressively and like sacrificing Bobble to the grinding station very much indicates that she is looking to get a breach kill sooner rather than later, not looking to rely solely on these constructs that can be made off of this saga as the saga does roll up to chapter two and be, get its ability to make Karn Strux in the first place. Now, you might be wondering, well, what kind of defenses do these decks have game one to the combo kill? And uh, Drake, I'm looking at the deck list here, and I think the answer is not much. Haywire might. Well, that <laughs> card already... is now in the graveyard. Right, that's already been expended. <laughs> so um, it's going to be a matter of mana, perhaps, but... Andrew is not going to yeah, be the, the one Yeah, the question here is, like, Jessie. there's no mana producer. So Jesse mm-hmm. can start going through her deck. If she deploys Breach right now, right? She can start going through her deck with the um, Grinding Station mm-hmm. and building up Storm, building up Storm. We already have the Grape Shot available to us, but we're a mana short, I think, from casting Grape Shot. But otherwise, we might be in the clear if we just play land. I think she has an Island in hand. So mm-hmm. we can play Breach. Yeah, we can play Island. And then we can just do the bobble thing a bunch of times and then escape the grape shot. We might be done here. The question right. is, does Andrew have any kind of response? And I don't think there's a lot that he can have, right? No, I don't think there is much he can have. However, you know, is okay, Jesse does not go for it here. Maybe there are not. So Andrew at 17, uh, that does take, you know, obviously Storm of 17. And it's going to cost Jesse, it looks like three cards in the deck for each, you know, bobble activation. So... Maybe was there was oh, Besaju it... potentially now? I mean, that's a card I spy as a one of in the deck list, and if okay. we can play around that one, maybe it's free to do so. Mm-hmm. And that's probably one of the only ways I see left, really, for these two to interact with each other in the main deck games. As far as once the combo's going, yeah, it it may be well, maybe there's not. Quite well. Now, I guess you couldn't really. You could just scrape shot twice if you had enough cards in the graveyard. So you wouldn't ever really run into a problem of decking yourself before you can kill the opponent. But that well, is right now she's more mana. On mana, right? Like, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, mana. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, what's the rush? If Jesse could just win the game doing the fair construct thing, and then mm-hmm. you know do the breach thing, she can play around everything. You know, I I can play around Besaju. I can play around any kind of weirdness as far as deck count goes. And you know, like I said, Jesse literally more or less put this archetype on the map so whatever it is she's playing around she feels it is worth it to do so and uh i'm gonna i'm gonna ask my best toward jesse know what's going on here is a card struck being made right here right away for andrew does make mana thanks to springleaf drum we're gonna see that happen right away and a ragavan dash happening once again now, Karn Struck can be made to go in the way, but have to imagine Andrew knows that, has a removal spell at the ready. He sure does. Here comes Unholy Heat. Maybe. Thinking about it for a second. There, yep. Unholy Heat does work. And we get to Grinding Station that one away for three more cards. Fable the Mirror Breaker, Emery Look of the Lock, and an Underworld Breach to the bin. All right. So maybe another reason Jesse may be, uh, way, may be in a stronger position when her Ursa Saw gets to Chapter 3, being able to search up another artifact that she may want to kickstart this combo as uh, I suppose anytime Ragavan attacks, there is some risk that your combo could be shot off if, they, if the Grape Shot is hit. But since it's already in the graveyard, uh, Jesse doesn't have to worry about that. So Saga will... Here goes Saga to three. Floats some right. mana. Mm-hmm. Oh, sleeves are being rolled up. Is it time? Is that, is that what it means? Are we time? Is it time, Jesse? Yeah. Here comes Mox Amber. All right. So Mox, the Mox Amber with Emery means we can start making some mana. And I think, I think she can play around everything. Because Besiege right. is not one mana. It is two because there's no legendary creatures in play. Mm-hmm. And the Haywire Might's already gone. So let's see what Jesse does. Gonna go ahead and grinding station that one away. I think we saw a shortcut there. Like the trigger enters the battlefield, activate grinding station, then untap it. So we're gonna see a little shortcut there. And three cards go to the bin alongside the Mox Amber. Now, if this was <clears throat> if this was just a lock, Andrew might just concede here. He knows there's no secrets in these deck lists. So yeah, they're the exact is... same deck. But once right. again, Andrew, if he's a pro tour caliber player, he might see if someone makes a mistake. It is a high pressure environment. Mm-hmm. I mean, both these players obviously work together, but Andrew, you can see doing a little bit of math here. Might just let Jesse play it out. I don't think the time restriction, the time spent is, you know, really anything to him. So no. you know, whatever. 
let's let's see what her plan is. Let's see how she moves. See how she uh, plans on winning the game. As some card is being escaped here, that'll be Mox Amber. Yeah, it's more or less free to do. Let's see if she makes a mistake. Yeah. And then, and... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she explains here is what the rest of this turn is going to look like, which certainly involves a lethal grave shot that we saw already in the graveyard and casting mm-hmm. zeros over and over again. And Jesse. I mean, a lopsided series so far for her as she picks up game number one in Modern after a very quick 2-0 in Pioneer, uh, putting on a little bit of a clinic here at the very beginning of this series. But it is, of course, not over. Andrew's still able to battle back. I guess we should take a look at the sideboards here and see exactly how players are going to sideboard. For I guess we should, reach. yeah. I mean, yeah, Andrew Ellenbogen, you're, you're proclaimed by you as the so-called Pro Tour champion. Uh, lost the first three <laughs> games here in this match. <laughs> now, again, both players having full information, both players knowing it's a 75-card mirror, there are a variety of forms of interaction here that we can likely see boarded in. I mean, the Urza Saga targets seem appealing. Pithing Needle, for example. I mean, Shadow Spear maybe for these Construct battles. Yeah, there's, there's two angles we have to think about when we're coming to the cyborg, right? Like we saw in game one, there's not a ton of ways to interact once the bridge thing gets started. That can mm-hmm. change here in the cyborg games. You yeah. can have cards like Pierce, Gust, Negate, even Tormod's Crypt, able to do some amount of kind of checking the the combo and having a little bit of, of recourse for that. But also, if you just spend all your time focusing on that, you are going to die to the Renin 6 plus Saga stuff where mm-hmm. you just get expressive iteration ground into the ground uh, without grinding station. <laughs> You're still getting ground out. And you find yourself uh, kind of sitting there holding the bag with a bunch of interaction. So I'm not, you know, totally sure. I, I do not have the same level of expertise Jesse does. I would take a guess that we want a little of column A, a little of column B, things like Beseju that are fairly free to include, likely. Mm-hmm. And I think actually we get to see Jesse fanning him out here. Negates, maybe Pierce's, Tormod's Crypt, the Beseju indeed, and Shadow Spear all kind of being pulled out of the sideboard and being held right now. I think those are the cards she's looking at. So yeah, that makes sense. And we see, we do see that, right? Like you called out Shadow Spear, allows you to win those like construct battles a lot better, but also you need some interaction for the combo wins. So a little column A, a little column B, uh, able to fight both plans and figure out how you want to do things. And Fable does a lot to glue that together, but we may mm-hmm. be cutting them as I think those are the cuts in her hand. Yeah, I was wondering there when we're looking at it, is is Jesse contemplating how she's cyborging or is she showing us how she's cyborging unclear maybe on I'm, what I'm her gonna head toward is the right ladder. <laughs> yeah right sure yeah yeah she's, she's yeah. no stranger to cyborging with no. and so i think maybe there's a little bit of consideration to how things change when mm-hmm. the player across from you both is playing the exact 75 and you have talked about how to sideboard against right. each other uh yeah but, i mean you're yeah. okay so you're your 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 teammates or you work together at least for this event uh how far does that go you're playing in this in the in semifinals here. Do you it's like you're like okay, we agreed the board like this. But now what if I make this change just to throw you off? I mean, does that does that happen? I mean, it's worth thinking how about. Much is like I said, you can go here, right? one yeah. side or the other, right? Like you could yeah. favor you could favor trying to beat combo, you can favor trying to beat the fair plan, and I'm sure you talked about which one happens more reliably in the cyber games. You could maybe try to pull a juke. I don't know how effective it's going to be, you know, right. with a 60 card deck and all that stuff. How likely is it to even come up? But so I would lean towards just doing the same old, same old and executing the best game plan you, you can. But uh, maybe there's a little bit of equity. And it, if nothing else, it's certainly worth thinking about. Sure. I mean, maybe if you if the you know pre-tournament practice suggested, well, Spell Pierce isn't that good in the mirror. So you don't bring it in. And then now you're like, well, now they know I'm not going to bring it in. That makes it good. I'll bring it in now. I mean, something like that, <laughs> yeah. maybe. But uh, probably both players can present the same 60 here after boarding and get underway. And Andrew, I mean... It's got to break serve here. It's got to win a game. Yeah, I mean, he's back against the wall. If he loses yeah. another game in this match, it's yeah. over. You know, his yeah. tournament's over, and Jesse's going to find herself in the finals. So Jesse, a dominant performance so far at the start. But part of the cool thing about best two out of three matches is it's not over yet. Andrew mm-hmm. could rattle back and still win this one from here, but he is going to have to start the winning right now. Right. Okay. So players still working on cyborging here. Um if, if this match concludes and the other one is still live, we'll jump over and see how Roger Suleiman and Zoe Riederman are doing on the other side of the bracket. But we're getting ready to present here uh, in the uh, primary semifinal, Andrew Ellenbogen and Jesse Robkin playing for a berth in the finals of the Energy 2022 Championship. We've had a long history of having great results and great events, exciting stuff. Players really looking back on these events as something they, once they've played in them, they really want to get back. And we had a lot of turnover this year compared to previously. 
uh, kind of new players, maybe the pandemic break contributed to that, or just a rising new generation of players in the Midwest. But um, I imagine a lot of these players I saw, I've been following on Twitter, a lot of the players kind of talking about, hey, I really enjoyed this tournament. Uh, even though I didn't win it, obviously, for the players that are eliminated, I really had a good time. Hopefully, those players want to be back. If you at home are thinking, hey, you know what? I can handle this. Jesse Robkin doesn't seem that great. I think I could beat her. I mean, <laughs> as Drake was saying, you're wrong, but you are very welcome to try. <laughs> Come on out. You're only wrong to you're not, Joe. But I'm telling you, the one thing, like you mentioned on Twitter, the one thing that all these players are saying, every single one of them said, this has been the most competitive year on the NRG mm -hmm. series, getting to this championship event. All of that has been the hardest, the most tightly played uh, events, matches, all of it uh, to date. And I think next year we're looking to step that up even more. When we went over some of those events, we should be getting some formats for those soon. If you want to test your luck and you say, hey, Drake, you're you're wrong. I'm better than Jesse. I'm better than Andrew. I'm going to show up. I'm going to beat him. I don't care if they're playing white weenie breach. I, I don't care. Then, you know, do so. Show up. Prove it. And this year, a lot of players, you mentioned that turnover, a lot of you know new faces that we've seen showed up, proved their worth, found their way here. And some of those have found their way all the way to top four here as these players getting underway. And Andrew. Going to need to prove it here once again. Back against the wall, as I believe we're on a mulligan. Jesse seems to have found a hand she likes. A lot of lands in this one for Andrew. We'll see if he's willing to keep it anyway. Yeah, this, I mean, these games aren't, I mean, well, they can end quickly. But, okay, going to five. I was going to say, in keeping a hand with that's, you know, somewhat land heavy, that's not something I necessarily would see you shy away from. If you have an answer to Ragavan, that's, I feel like that's the primary thing you want to keep, even if it's seven or it's a five. Uh, I want a couple land, and I want to deal with the early Ragavan or Emery if there is one. Yeah, certainly. And uh, I think while while we're doing a little bit more shuffling up, let's talk about the commentator picks. Do we I have to? We get that slide up real quick. What? But I believe I'm eliminated as uh, Connor did find his way felled to the rematch to Jesse Robkin for the Player of the Year race. Uh, did lose in Pioneer this time, piloting Lotus Field instead of Mono Green. But let's talk about the rest of them. Matt gone, but Raja still in the running. For Honorok, Dom, and Julian, and Andrew Ellenbogen, you see right there for Becky. Back against the wall. Becky's yeah. pick, not doing great. And Joe, Joe, your pick was, was eliminated a long time ago. I'm sorry. Yeah, Derek, Derek Davis <laughs> let me down. I picked Derek Davis partially on the on the merits of the Elementals deck. Seems to win every event in your rage where it does well. Uh, Derek went 3 in Modern with Elementals uh, and thus is no longer with us in this event. So my pick is certainly not going to win. But... Uh, you know, it's you know we're all winners here, right? Because we get to enjoy this great magic. So we're all equivalent. Let's just ignore the fact that my pick got <laughs> okay. Well, we're rushing that under the rug. Uh, see, Joe, yeah. I, I love that's what I love about you is you know when when I when I, when I call someone a so called Pro Tour champion, you make sure to remind <laughs> me at every moment. But, you know, you make a little, you make a bad call or whatever. We swipe, we sweep it under the rug. That's, that's, that's exactly that's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you understand the rules. All right, so we are underway here uh, in uh, game two of the second match. Of this semifinal, Andrew on five cards with a scalding turn and a bobble, bobbling himself there, probably looking for. Well, when you're at five cards, you're just looking for, you know, what do I refer to? I guess it's still the same. You need a couple land, you need a way to deal with the legendary creatures, and then the rest so, will just you come catch as it goes. mechanics, too, right? Like yeah. things like Ren and Six, Expressive Iteration, like these cards are what's going to recover you from this mulligan. Because, like, once again, it's not super easy to just bust out a kill super fast like yeah. other combo decks. It could be like, okay, I'm on five, but I don't care. My cards are so powerful, I'm going to kill you anyway. This match has some amount of fair game that needs to be played so mm -hmm. that you don't just die to that plan before you can even start to look to the combo type strategies. And I think we're going to see that begin for Andrew here with the Saga. That's one of the cards that's going to help. That can produce a lot of value in one card, and Andrew needs those kinds of effects if he wants to stay in this game and this series. Yeah, and Jesse Lee on an island is very interesting to me. As island, I mean, well, for one thing, it it shuts off any possibility of running six coming off the top. So I wouldn't think you'd make that choice if you if you I wouldn't think you'd make that play if you had a choice. There's a Tormat script, and yet does Jesse have colored mana? I don't think so. You don't see a ton, but it yeah. might not matter. As we see, her plan kind of seems to result, revolve around this Emery Lurker of the Lock, able to be played on turn two, thanks to the help of Tormod's Crypt coming out of the sideboard. So now, now we have some of the angles checked, right? We have a bobble in the graveyard, so we already got the uh, a great hit, by the way, off of Emery, which is quickly going to have to be dispatched by that Lightning Bolt. Otherwise, she's going to start to run away with the game in a fair way, but also just has the unfair plan from Andrew checked, thanks to this Tormod's Crypt. Uh, at least for a short period of time, as Andrew's saga is the first to roll up to two and begin to start making some car instructs. Misty Rainforest deployed. Yeah, I think, so I think 
Jesse's turn two looked real good despite Ren not well, looking as castable. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty clear that Jesse to Andrew that Jesse does not have another land unless it's maybe another Urza saga. And I think Andrew has drawn the Haywire Might again. And oh, this no. time that might be a little more useful than it was previously. I think it might be. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I, it, we have a choice now between making the first Karn struck or right. just blowing up Jesse Saga, right? It seemed Andrew made his choice with no spell played there, able to still deploy it next turn and doesn't have any confirmation that Jesse has no further lands and right. we do see her deploy a land. So she does have a land, it's just not one that you ideally want to commit to the board either. True. In the True. But we can see a bunch of red cards stranded in hand right now. Yeah, a lot, a lot of red spells stranded in hand, but that may not matter quite yet, as mm -hmm. this game currently seems to be about activating sagas, as Andrew is the first to do so. Going to make a construct there on the end step. Untap. We'll see if he's interested in making another one before he gets to go a searching. And doing a quick think. There is a trigger on the stack. You can't see yet, but that saga does need to roll up to a third chapter. Making some decisions now. And we are going to activate, make another construct. Response. Jesse makes her first construct. All right. So this game already looking a little different than the last one. Something, I mean, we played that last game. No red and six was found last game. Really, the, the creatures didn't do much either. The players both had reactive hands and then Jesse comboed out. This game already looking different. Yeah, and Jesse, certainly, if she could deploy any of these Renin Sixes and begin to mm -hmm. start chaining these Urza Sagas, I'm sure that's going to be a huge problem for Andrew to overcome. But Renin Six, that splash uh, of green is not free, mm -hmm. as we see, you know, a little bit of mana color issues for Jesse Robkin here. And despite being able to play all the good cards, they're not always the most castable. And so we're going to see exactly how much that's going to matter. You know, Jesse can make the same trick Andrew's doing here, go get her own Springleaf drum, but the defenses are down a little bit as far as being able to block for the red and six, uh, these construct tokens of Andrew's because mm -hmm. he is on the play and gets to attack first and is doing so here for four. I mean, Follow are, we, up. Right. are we even playing modern if there's no fetch lands for Jesse? Like what format? Is, I mean, that's like <laughs> the funny aspect of, of the format. And yet, uh, yeah, short of fetch line here. And it, is is showing i mean this oh like certainly and saga saga is kind of like a fetch land it just fetches yeah. artifacts you know yeah <laughs> i suppose that's Come true. On. <laughs> it's a land that fetches i'm talking about a, a yeah all right Fair <laughs> enough. anyway uh you're right spring leaf drum would turn on colored manny other colored manny here for jesse i guess it's, i say the lack of colored man it's really just red the problem is that she doesn't just need like one other color one red Right now, she can use about yeah, three. Yeah, she needs a lot of help yeah. for sure. And Andrew Andrew being ahead on artifacts here is going to potentially come up. You mm -hmm. know, having the bigger constructs does matter. Each artifact kind of representing a glorious anthem for these constructs. Part of why they're so powerful. It's very easy to do. But, you know, maybe having to tap one to deploy this Ren isn't super exciting. And I think Jesse already has another Saga dialed up mm -hmm. uh, in hand. So not really even that interested in deploying one to begin with. So yeah, Jesse, instead of floating, we had to do anything like that. Going to go ahead and make a construct. Go find her copy of Springleaf Drum. And we'll see exactly what she's going to do, if anything, with that. Construct's now the same size. Yeah, Across that is board. certainly significant. Um, and an attack by Andrew. Uh, yeah, this Ragavan. I mean, Treasures obviously help grow the Constructs, but Ragavan unlikely to be able to get through. And yeah, that's yeah, true. Like Jesse saga with was, another saga follow up right. does put some pressure on Andrew, right? Because now Andrew gets to be the first one to attack with these constructs. But the problem is he doesn't have another saga already. He has all the colors. So if you do something like a red and six, you know, maybe you could change that. But Jesse's the one with the red and sixes and the sagas. So if this game goes on for a long time from now, it currently looks like if we're just doing the fair thing that Jesse's going to win. So now Andrew needs to decide either he needs to get aggressive with the attack force he's assembled. Or he needs to start to look towards, okay, I need to get a kill going. As this Mox Hammer does actually tap for red mana right now, thanks to Ragavan over there on the other side of Springleaf Drum. I wonder if this Haymire would... Yeah, so Andrew's going to play um, expressive iteration here, looking for a land drop and you know something else to further his game game plan. But the Haywire might here actually able to pick off the Springleaf Drum or a potential the Tormod script. I mean, it's... Or there's a Saga. I mean, everything. It can even pick yeah. off... Yeah, I mean, it can pick off the Saga, right? Yeah, but creature hitting... enchantment. But hitting the uh, hitting the drum obviously shrinks Jesse's constructs, but even just the hammer might itself existing grows Andrews. So it doesn't even really have to sacrifice in order to potentially enable an attack here. Jesse yeah, contemplating and... a response to this iteration. 
I, I think now Jesse has loudly declared, I have spell pierce. And so now, you know, even if you don't cast it, there's, it's lower equity to even cast it now. But, you know, even if Andrew knows about it, it does constrict part of what he can even do with his turn. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I've already tapped a lot of my mana. If I want to get a nice clean two for one out of this iteration that isn't just more lands, which we know he already started with a ton of them, uh, then he's going to have to run into the spell pierce anyway. And it is expiring, so, you know, having it be face up at this point is also a lower impact. But, like, that's what that pause does. And that's part mm -hmm. of why the pause was so long. Because once you start thinking about it, it's face up. As Mistress Ooh. Bobble wow. able to be played around spell. Okay, so Andrew's Construct's now already larger. And I think and the only two cards left in Andrew's hand. I thought hey, where I might was there. Maybe I'm wrong. I have to imagine if he had that card, it'd be deployed. Yeah, yeah there it is. is. So I was like, I think we have to be playing that one this turn. This okay. is the spot where it's going to be really good. And it certainly is, as these card constructs are now growing out of control. Yeah. Seven sevens, I believe. Right? Three, four, five, six, no, six sixes. Six yeah. sixes. Six okay. sixes versus Jesse's four fours. So even a double block here isn't... Okay, there's a double block there. So Hero White can be sacrificed, but that will reduce Andrew's size as well and thus not be very beneficial. Yeah, it's well, the same, right? You're moving yeah. one, we're moving one Actually, from both sides. So, well, okay. If Hayward Might takes out Springleaf Drum, let's just say. So Andrew's mm -hmm. becomes a five and Jesse's are threes. So I would actually trade two for one then because both of Jesse's constructs would die in that scenario. So maybe that is still something that's worth considering from Andrew's side. We'll find out. The attack is on the board here. True. That is true. But Jesse also actually has a lightning bolt too in hand to finish one off. Mm -hmm. So like maybe, you know, I don't know. It's th There's a lot to think about here as far as the combat math goes. It looks like no moves have been made, which I think makes some amount of sense. A lot of tricks represented on both sides of the table here. Haywire Might and then you know, Spell Pierce Bolt, all the, all the like mm -hmm. for Jesse. So uh, with Andrew kind of just winning on the current status quo, I, I don't hate, you know, his move of saying, all right, I just don't have to move here. You're the first one that's going to have to start doing stuff because I'm winning. But once Maybe. again, I can't underst understate that saga that's sitting there at one right. right now. Starts to get up to two and Jesse can start to flip the script. Yeah. Well, maybe Andrew's going to take out the saga here. I mean, that would also be reasonable. What it feels like we have yeah. to do here. And yeah. I think, yeah, he agrees that that, that you yeah. just can't let that one go. And that's going to help swing the life point race a little bit too. A little bit of life, of course, always good. Life gain is at its best when it is incidental. And being able to go ahead and exile, not even put in the graveyard for breach, exile that uh, Urza Saga is huge. And Lightning Bolt's going to be a little bit mana efficient and go ahead and take that one out on instep. Mm -hmm. On Ragavan and Unholy Heat, the draw, which I believe does take care of the last construct that Andrew Ombogan has. Jesse able to clear the field here or can play Ren finally and then pick up a red source uh, nice. in Stomping Ground that's in the graveyard and still clear the board. And that's going to be a great spot for her to beat. Yeah, and this is going to be, I mean, Andrew with only just one card left in hand, uh, plus the Jonathan Companion that's, you know, available, I guess, but that's not going to yeah, put that, up much. Not of worth a whole lot when this right. farm start can start getting really big with Ren buying back the other two sagas that are in the graveyard. And mm -hmm. this is what I was talking about, right? Like, the combo is not really even in the zip code of either player's radar right now, right? This game is 100% about the constructs from Urza Saga. And that's why this deck is so powerful. It's like, okay, great. Good for you. You boarded in all these interactive spells. They don't matter. But Jesse kind of has it all anyway with Andrew's really low mulligan. He's had a little bit of help, but Jesse's card is certainly more powerful now that her mana issues are unlocked. And Stomping Ground was shocked, and we are indicating that. And we know about the unholy heat that can happen at mm -hmm. literally any point. So we'll see. I mean, there's certainly some temptation, I would imagine, to pick off the construct now because of the Springleaf Drum. It does add a mana source to Andrew's side. Okay, maybe it was just... Let Andrew bobble. She anticipates Andrew's going to bobble something, look at his card, and now she's going to fire this off. Yeah, it feels like a spell piercer in a gate. I, I like having the mana be required mm -hmm. to be tapped on the main phase. Sure. Jesse does have another Ren and Six dialed up. So next turn, you know, thanks to the stomping ground, she can play one with her own construct back as protection if things go wrong here. So I actually like waiting quite a bit there and doing it in response. And that way, if he does have it already, you know, mm -hmm. you get to make him use his mana on his turn. If not, then, you know, whatever. It's all the same. As here comes a Saga for Andrew Ellenbogen, which could could help. It now, could. we know Jesse's getting one back next turn, but Jesse's already ahead of Construct. And it, with this game being about Constructs, that one Construct Jesse has in play is huge right now. Gigantha goes to hand. You laughed at Gigantha. Andrew's like, it's I need so Gigantha. Pick it up. <laughs> Nobody's casting that. He's what are you talking about? Saga for the rest of the game. Uh. Gigantha's gonna... I mean, we, we saw Gigantha last night do all kinds of work. He actually kept for mana twice. I don't think I've ever seen that before in Constructed Magic. 
but, true, true. but it did happen. All right. So here's a fetch land for for Jesse, a, an actual fetch land Drake, not a land that you know fetches <laughs> artifacts. But true, uh, true. that is the play here. That means that uh, Saga is not going to be entering the battlefield this turn. I think if you're Andrew, that has to be a really bad sign. It's, it's scary, right? Because it means Jesse's you know going to unlock more of her hand, and we know there's been red cards stuck in there for a while. It could represent just dying here. Yes, that's, that's think certainly true. That grinding station plus breach is straight lethal. And with Andrew tapped out, uh, I think this might just be lethal. If Jesse's not if Jesse's not fighting on the uh, Saga axis anymore, uh, yeah, you just yeah, we see him rubbing his hands together. I I think it's prayer time as Andrew's entire tournament is on the line right now, already behind a match, already behind a game in this match. You know, if Jesse has a kill here, that is it. That is it for Andrew. There's no more. No more magic to be played. And we'll see exactly what mm -hmm. Jesse is doing with her turn. But, oh, man, it is not looking good for Andrew. And there is Underworld Breach. There is the Breach, yeah. No, Andrew not entirely tapped out. It does have a Scalding Tarn and two mana-producing artifacts that are of questionable value at the moment. <laughs> None of them Tormod's Crypt, which no. is the most relevant part of the equation right now, as three cards going to get exiled. Emery going to jump three cards in the yard, and like I said, if Grinding Station's hit, I think we're all done here. We might just be done here anyway, but it is not clear to me. As two Underworld Breaches, Lightning Bolt, and Land added to the graveyard. Well, yeah, with a zero mana artifact in the graveyard, or uh, alternatively, the Tormod's Crypt is in play. It doesn't make a difference, really. There is a lot of work to be done here, just the Grinding Station and the bobble to just sacrifice and dig uh, three at a time. Je Jesse amusingly losing track of where her exiles almost twice in the last 10 seconds. But uh, I mean, there's a lot going on in this. Yeah, there is. This, yeah, this, there's a lot. <laughs> and there's also, I mean, this is the moment where you know that you're very, very close to the finals. So even if you're not normally battled, you know, influenced by butterflies, nerves, whatever you want to call them, here I would think almost any player uh, is, is really starting to feel, you know, if you're on the verge of winning, it's it's easy to, to you know freeze up and just be like, okay, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up. I gotta be really careful. What what can we do? What can we do? And I like the I like the little white die there. You see, that actually represents the number of cards mm -hmm. that Jesse's gonna be drawing. And we see Ren ticked up to return that saga to hand. Jesse smartly left that yeah. one around. Breach gonna go to graveyard on the instep. Upkeep, Jesse's gonna have two cards coming. So we kind of get to see the fair mode of underworld breach there. Bringing back Emery and drawing two cards off of bobbles is uh extremely powerful. And of course, it had the ceiling of if Jesse just flips over right. grinding station to Emery, the game's just over. Yeah. So being able to split the difference there where it's like, okay. You know, you could try to call that a disaster and you'd just be completely wrong. Like, Jesse didn't win the game with Underworld Breach, but she just put herself even more ahead and still picked up the Urza's Saga by having a turn like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is more of a... This was an optimistic breach to so like, maybe I can win the game, and if I don't, I still generate card advantage, which is what we actually saw happen. And, and yeah, certainly still... And passing, and shields are not down for Jesse with several cards in hand, and looks like... Stomping Ground plus Springleaf from available. So there is room to interact in case Andrew gets up to some business here on his turn. Oh, wow. And she picked up another piece of interaction, too. We see Spell Pierce and Unholy Heat both okay. able to be played on this turn cycle. And, you know, uh, those are just going to be so big for keeping Andrew from being able to steal this game from underneath Jesse with something like an Underworld Breach turn. If she didn't already have that covered with mm -hmm. the Tormod script she played on turn, like, one, I think, all the way back to the beginning of the game there on the right, right next to her deck. So she kind of has all angles covered here. She already is ahead on the Construct race, having one in play. She has Unholy Heat if the game does start to become about that. She has Ren plus Saga going. Andrew's going to have to find uh, quite a mixture of cards in order to be able to punch through this lock that Jesse has put together on this game. Yeah, he's behind on basically every element, every way that you can be behind. And here's a fifth land. And is this going to be Jagatha? I mean, Jagatha does, <laughs> I mean, yeah. sure. does turn on... The Mox Amber and the Springleaf Drum. So he would actually have two mana available in that case if it didn't get picked off immediately to Unholy Heat. Uh, but I think yeah, that's what we're going to see. Gigantha, bigger than a construct here. So Andrew foregoing the first construct creation and instead deploying his Gigantha. So, you know, me, entirely wrong. You, smart as always. Gigantha, big part of the mix here for Andrew. And like you said, two mana available. Jesse decides not worth it to Unholy Heat. Don't care yet. My Saga <laughs> token is going to be bigger than that anyway. And so you can have your Gigantha, nothing matters. Mm -hmm. As Saga is deployed finally by the Ren and Six. I'm sorry, yeah. by picked up by the Ren and Six, deployed, of course, by Jesse. That'd be Three so scary for Andrew. I mean, thinking, 
all right, I've only got two cards. My opponent's got about six, and they have a much better board than me. And yet, Jesse picks up Jagatha. So, okay, maybe you take a breath, and you're like, oh, I'm likely to live another turn. Yeah, I mean, if you're injured, you can't beat really anything else. <laughs> like, yeah. you can, Jesse can't have more good ones because they are so far behind at this point that – you know, you really need her to have a weak turn finally. And I'd argue this is about the floor on the turn mm -hmm. she could produce, which is just like a ran activation and every activation and buying Gigantha. So, you know, unexciting and exactly what Andrew needs if he's trying to find a hole in this game for him to be able to start to flip the script. Jesse on a low life total. So maybe we could try to sneak an attack in eventually. This construct, of course, holding down the fort mm -hmm. and crypt actually cracked here on upkeep maybe a little bit of extra insurance against any kind of underworld breach turn that could be assembled and of yeah. course can be bought back at basically any time with emery it is interesting that uh i wonder what her reason was for doing it right there instead of waiting for the urza saga to hit the graveyard which is going to happen immediately oh and you know what it's because of pithing needle joe yeah she doesn't yeah. want to get pithing needled from the urza saga so she fires it off right there okay makes sense and Knowing that the Hailware Might is already gone is probably a little comforting, as that is another way for things to get broken up from Andrew's side. Jesse's is still in the deck somewhere. Yeah, and she does have sagas that can start tutoring up these these artifacts. I mean, we know about probably Shadow Spear being in the mix. Mm -hmm. We know Haywire might being in the mix. And, you know, as soon as her sagas start working, that's just more problems for Andrew. The construct's already a big problem. Then the whatever artifacts are being searched up. An even bigger problem, and Piffing Needle coming into play. Have to imagine that's it, naming either Urza Saga or Red and Six. We'll see exactly what kind of confirmation we can get on that. But uh, if I'm a if I'm a gambling man, I, I have to imagine it's Saga or Ren. I think those are the two most problematic things going on on Jesse's board. But hey, could be something like Emery. Production, give it to us again. Okay, Needle did name Urza Saga. Okay, so that makes sense. Certainly. Especially with uh, Ren six unplayed, so Jesse's never going to run out of sagas. Are we going to have Giganta attack here, or is it tapping for mana? Come on, Andrew, make I think my you day. have to attack. All right, right, like and Ren yeah. at five, going to go ahead yeah. and get taken out by the Giganta. We'll see what else. I mean, that's step one. We do mm -hmm. know Jesse has another one dialed up, so not even that big of an issue. But you know, whatever. A big a, a, a win finally, and Spell Pierce coming down. That's going to check the last two mana sources. And there's maybe a second spell pierce. Oh yeah, how about the second one? Wow, <laughs> counter spell the hard way. Gonna take yeah. care of the unholy heat. Only one mana left available because of springleaf drum. No further mana. Unholy heat not gonna work. Emery gonna stay in play, continuing. We're by oh, no. bobble. We're by oh, that. so another land post. Oh, the spell pierce bad. with the springleaf drum in play, which could have tapped the construct for mana. All right, Jonathan gets picked off here. Uh, now that Jesse has found Delirium once again. Yeah, we'll see what Jesse assembles for I mean, the that turn. Was, it might be yet another Underworld Breach. This was a pretty good couple minutes no. for Andrew. He was looking pretty dead in the water and now, you know, interacted quite a bit. And Jesse's still ahead, but probably by less. Of course, if you're watching here right now and you're just joining us, there's a little bit of information going on in the Twitch chat. You can see a little pinned message by the Energy Series, giving you a little bit of update on the backup match. And of course, if you're joining us now and you haven't been here the whole time, this is the top four. Andrew, back against the wall, looking to win. If you like this kind of paper ma magic coverage, please, 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 please follow, subscribe, support Energy and the work that they are doing. As we see Bobble once again returned and sacrificed. All right, uh, Jesse is just... Okay, so we know Urza Saga is not going to make any more constructs, at least for the moment. But plenty of card advantage to be found. Here's an iteration for Jesse. I think there's another copy in hand as well. Finds? Well, uh, that's not super exciting. Oh, it's a Shadow Spear. Shadow Spear has to be decent, right? Yeah. Like the, the board state is beginning to matter again as mm -hmm. far as you know power toughness and what have you. Yeah. Another Saga deployed, able to not able to make constructs thanks to that Pithing Needle, of course. You can see that. That's going to prevent Jesse from making any more constructs. It's not going to prevent Jesse from searching up artifacts. And she taps a ton of mana, and it's Gigantha time. I can't let's believe we had Gigantha it. on both sides in this game. This is insane. And let's also, take a look at the companion. No cards can have the same mana symbol as Wooburg, but you can't spend it on generic costs, which actually is a huge downside. Can't activate yeah. Sagas or anything like that with that mana. But... If nothing else, a 5-mana 5-5 is obviously worth something in this game as both players have paid 8 mana to both buy and cast theirs. Jesse, last one standing with one. 
Uh, I, I think they're just doing it in order for Mox Amber to be able to tap for anything. I mean, that's just a pretty cool thing. I mean, yeah, that's the sole it's reason. Sugar. Right? I mean, Springleaf draw Mox Amber. Actually, it's not line. even it's anything. Matter a lot. It's not yeah. even anything. It's just red or green. I was thinking because it Giganta taps the rainbow, Mox Amber would too. That that's kind of shouldn't it do that? Shouldn't we have an adjustment to the rules so that does it, it need work? to do more, Joe? Does it really need to do more? I don't think it needs to do more, Joe. Uh, it I makes five mana on its own. Amber really only normally makes red with Ragavan anyway. So God, I mean, it works. It works. This is a team or breach deck. It makes two of your colors. You're fine. Are right, we going to see Haywire Might here? We are. So Haywire oh, Might off Haywire Saga Might. can... And that pitch- can take care of the pithing needle. Right. And then it's the Sagas are back online. And that's a big problem for Andrew Allen Bogan. Yes, it is. So once again, uh, falling behind, further behind on the board, Andrew may be still... I mean, there, he's got a decent graveyard there, even though he's been hit by Tormod's Crypt once. Maybe if he draws a Breach, he can get, you know, something going here. But Jesse's already used a couple of Spell Pierce. I don't think they have any more, so he doesn't have to worry about that. I think Jesse may want to start looking to use Emery to buy back the Crypt. She's yeah. already ahead on cards wildly. So, you know, if you're just looking to check the other ways that Andrew can still get you, I think the Crypt becomes appealing. And I think we're actually going to see that right now. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what's going to happen is she rebuys Crypt here just to check all angles. You know, keep that lock on, that lock she's had the entire mm-hmm. time where she's winning the fair mode and she's winning on stopping the unfair mode. That's what this mirror is about. And that's what Jesse has masterfully executed in this game. But of course, Andrew was on a little mulligan, had a few things come up his way, drew a few good ones to help, you know, get him in this game. But now... I mean, Jesse firmly in the driver's seat with multiple sagas running, Emery running, the board checked, and a Tormod's Crypt in play. I'm not even sure what Andrew's looking, but I'm sure it has to start with something like Expressive Iteration to start to look at more cards. I mean, that's a pretty good thought. I mean, there's what else can he do here that matters? Um, a lot of things that you would normally use to generate advantage. I mean, Urza Saga is currently locked out by his own Pithy Needle. I suppose if he drew one, Jesse maybe could just leave it alone. But all right, here's an Emery. All right, that's... That's fine. Yeah, that's going to flip over a breach, uh, which is and unfortunate. But what are you going to do? I mean, four cards go in. So Emery available. But is the Emery going to survive? I mean, Jesse can't currently kill it, I guess. Uh, but she does yeah. have this recurring Tormod script. So that makes it tough for the, uh, the Emery to get much done. True. Yeah, exactly. Like the Emery's just kind of checked. It's definitely a little late to the party. Even if it did work, like uh, Jesse gets to activate hers first, is already way ahead on the bobble cards. Like Emery does. It probably helps the most by putting more cards in the graveyard. But once mm-hmm. again, Jesse having the crypt just has all angles covered as right. we have two sagas that need to roll up here. We'll see what she wants to do with those. And potentially the option to just activate both of them this turn. And that may just be good enough. Jesse maybe doesn't even need to cast another spell for the rest of the game. Yeah. I mean, know, constructs, just activate crypt plus uh, I mean, these, these two attack attackable constructs here are already very large, are getting bigger. And then there's also Gigantha. So... Andrew's going to be forced to block if he's even given the privilege of being able to do that. And there's a Shadow Spear also as well. Yeah, this is a... Looking bad. This is bad, Andrew, yes. he maybe gets one more turn to try to find an answer to what's going on here. But, I mean, even... Like I said, I think it has to involve expressive iteration into multiple good ones because mm. I don't even think there's a single card that gets him out. So it has right. to involve multiple cards, which starts with something like expressive iteration. Uh, we'll see exactly what he can come up with. But Jesse, very, very proactive, activating that Tormod script. Get that out of here. Maybe he's willing to rebuy it right away. She sure is. Don't want to lose the power toughness on the creatures when you go to attack. Mox Amber was found off of that first, uh, that saga, running out of targets, actually. I think she was fanning through. It was like bobbles, basically, were the only things left. Can rebuy things like Haywire Might as well. And mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, maybe Andrew doesn't even get another turn. I haven't done any of the math here, but if we can He's, get rid of the creatures and all that he, stuff that we're yeah. on. I mean, he can block with uh, his construct here to stay alive or with Emery, but he's going to need to block something. As two of these constructs, as well as the Gigantha, can swing in here if if she wants. And there's, how many artifacts does Jesse have right now? Three. Looks like seven, maybe. It's uh, a lot. Yeah, they're doing yeah. a lot of pointing, a lot of math, a lot of artifacts in play. These, God, these creatures are huge. The thing is, I don't think they're 15 on their own. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I count seven sevens. Okay, so we have an eight, eight, a seven, seven, and a five, five. Uh, that's 20. Andrew has how much toughness of blockers? Five? So he would yes. have to block well, a non- oh, that yeah, that, Well, that's just enough. Blocking. Jesse yeah, wins wow. this match and is going to advance thanks to winning the previous match. A clean sweep, 2-0, 4-0 of Andrew Ellen Bogan in both formats. The 150-card mirror, Jesse showing prowess with both decks and able to advance to the finals that was of impressive. our championship event. That, that was something. That was, uh, you know, 
whether you're rooting for Andrew or whether you're rooting for Jesse, I don't think you thought there was going to be anyone thought there was going to be a 4-0 sweep in either direction. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that, that was really something else. So Jesse Robkin, congratulations to her. Andrew L. Mogan's run ends in the semifinals, an impressive showing. I don't know if we have the other semifinals still running. Okay, we do. We're going to go into the other semifinal right now. So we have Raja Suleiman and Zoe Reederman. Uh, okay, we're getting information on where we're at. This is game two of match number three. So this is best. Nope. Okay. All right. I'm being corrected. It's game two of match number two. So Raja Suleiman up a match. Zoe Reederman up a game in match number two. All right. That's where we stand. Uh, we're playing Pioneer, obviously. And this looks like Thoughtseize being played from Raja Suleiman. Zoe Reederman has kept a one land hand. I don't believe that force is in play. I believe that's in her hand. And it's just not selectable by the Thoughtseize. And so, yeah, here we are. If you're uh, wondering why we're we switching formats in the middle of a round, well, it's best two out of three matches, and both formats are in play. So we saw Pioneer and Modern in the other semifinal, and here we are in match number two. We're playing Pioneer here. Yeah, and this is this is actually interesting, too, because there's some things that can be derived based on what we're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. So Raja, I believe the higher seed, had to have chosen uh, or chose a format first and uh you know, obviously was able to be victorious in whatever format he chose. I believe it was Pioneer. Zoe, this go round, was, I think, the seed two player and chose to be on the play in Pioneer again. So mm -hmm. after, I think, losing the first go round in Pioneer, we have her choosing Pioneer again, but this time on the play. And, uh, of course, with Modern Green Devotion, was able to win game number one. So have to imagine she thinks that this matchup, likely very play draw dependent, likely means that the uh, the match they just played was fairly close and she still likes her chances. So I actually like the confidence in your Pioneer play, your Pioneer deck, to just run it back after losing right away, being like, I can win this, run it back again, and starting off, you know, being rewarded for it with a win the first go round as mm -hmm. duress, another discard spell coming down, looking to hit one of the three non creature spells in Jesse's hand, going after the mana is Raja in, in Zoe's hand. Yeah, and Zoe did draw a forest off the top there. Uh, it looks like Raja down a card, so probably took a mulligan. Here's a fatal push. So, fortunate for Zoe to have drawn that land, and then here's an oath. So, that's great. Certainly drawing the tools to just establish a mana base as Zoe, as Raja does his best to wreck it preemptively. All right, and there is. A Nykthos, so so we will Nykthos, not... normally a good find later. Not yeah. doing a lot now as the board is fairly clear. Well, it's a land. That's something. <laughs> it is at least a land. I think Zoe did need some of those in order to start casting some of her more expensive cards that were not taken by Raja's discard spells. A big part of the equation here is moving to the late game as Blood Tithe Harvester deployed for Raja. It was moved to Jesse's turn three. Kiora coming down. Zoe, again, this is Zoe Riederman playing against Raja Suleiman. And okay, Sorry, yeah, yeah, I'm going to use the blood right <laughs> away to uh, for the bloodhead harvester, throw away the extra swamp and more discard. And Raja sees, well, I don't think he's taking another Kiora, so we've got Cavalier and we've got Vivian, both five drops, both playable with a land, but currently uncastable. Yeah, maybe we'll a tough exactly. decision here for Raja. Obviously, it's not an instantaneous choice on his side. He's giving this some thought. Yeah, the question here is right, land off the top, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of the question here, I think. So what's the biggest problem if a land comes? And what's the biggest problem if a land doesn't come? The answer may be the same, but yeah, we're gonna have to get a read. This does not kill my blood tithe harvester, right? It does not, but it does have a lot of loyalty. It's mm -hmm. going to be hard to kill with just your small one blood tithe harvester that you have access to right now. I wonder, I mean, if if it's actually like in, in Raja's mind an equivalent decision, then maybe you choose Cavalier based on the fact that we know duress is imported in. If you draw another duress and you take the and you take the Vivian here, then it's not worth very much, assuming Zoe doesn't draw land. So I don't know that that would play into the decision process at all. It is the Cavalier that's chosen. And yeah, Raja's empty handed. Yeah, Raja empty-handed, facing down Jesse's. I mean, even if she bricks, she just has a series of good spells, right? So, like, if if she finds mana before Raja really assembles anything at all, then this could start to get really nasty. But I think she needs a single land to start it up. Drake, it looks you're, like... Drake you're killing me, man. Jesse won her match. This is Zoe Reederman. Zoe, I'm sorry. 
my actual screen is flickering a lot. So I am having to play catch up while we're doing this. And I absentmindedly am saying Jesse because we just said Jesse like 9,000 times. Zoe Readerman needs to draw mana in order to be able to cast her powerful spells, which are going to do a good job of catching her up, uh, provided that she can literally ever cast them. Like things mm -hmm. like Storm of the Festival can undo basically all of the work that the discard spells have done this game if Raja can't close the distance in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Like he has to assemble enough attacking force to end the game before Zoe can cast any of these powerful spells. And really it only takes like one or two of them because yeah. uh, Vivian can snowball it. Uh, the uh, Storm the Festival by itself can snowball the game. Both of these cards, problems on their own. And that's irregardless of other things that Zoe could draw off the top of her deck. So Raja appeared to give quite a bit of thought on what he wanted to attack there, which is interesting. Um, I guess you could think, well, I'll just attack the... Planeswalker later, and since there's another copy in hand anyway, here's a Bone Crusher Giant to join up. Bone Crusher Giant does add a lot to the attack. Ooh, and there's a land. Okay. So we found the land, though. So that was, I think, on time because Raja did find a little bit of pressure. Gonna make five mana here and deploy the Vivian. Reed. All right. All right. Well, now having two planes, two creatures on their side, it's. Makes it quite a bit harder for it to, to survive. Let's see. What do we find here? Okay, a forest. Yeah, making sure. I think we're rereading Vivian Reed to see what happens to the bottom cards. Yeah, those are going to get put on to the bottom randomly. Forest added to hand, but that doesn't mean we can cast Storm the Festival's next turn. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, actually, oh, and another Bone Crusher Giant for Raja. That's a big pickup, I think, because adding that much more to the attack force when you can already clear the Vivian and then you can have another uh, Bone Crusher Giant dialed up mm -hmm. in order to finish the game before Zoe can actually cast the Storm of the Vessels. Like I said, this, this attack force is actually almost exactly what Raja needed. All right, so... Bone Crusher could just attack Vivian and then Stomp could take it down, but no, he's just going to preserve the cards in hand, it looks like. Or maybe he'll just commit to the board. Yeah, okay, he's just going to put all the clock out there, not worried about having to bring out creatures, and just hoping Zoe continues to, to miss somewhat. Old Growth Troll, however, seems oh, ideal. Help. Yeah. yeah, that one's going to help a lot, because I think we can play both that and the uh, Vivian... I'm sorry, Kiora, mm -hmm. being the Beckoner, to untap some mana. Yeah, got to do a forest in order to cast the old growth troll. That'll even give Zoe another card for her right. trouble, just a little extra sugar on top. But being able to deploy a very relevant blocker and get a little bit more like mana going on her following turn, a big pickup and fatal push, a pretty good card. Not actually online just yet. Do need no. to enable revolt. Yeah, no, this is going to be tough now, Raja. I might be kind of somewhat stuck. I mean, attacking into old growth troll actually increases Zoe's available mana. Uh, he could kill... I mean, if you send in the whole team to kill Kiora, is that is that a... That, that doesn't seem very appealing. Yeah, I mean, because Kiora dies literally no matter what the blocks. So, you know, Zoe is incentivized to just eat one of your creatures. Right. It doesn't feel good at all. And... You know, then you get to keep four devotion still in play. That Nick though starts to look really scary in the following turn. Yeah, this this attack in Zoe still at twenty. That storm of the festival, I believe that Roger knows about from early discard spells, still lingering. And yeah, mm. he makes this attack, but I don't think he can be super excited about it. Certainly yeah. didn't snap it off. Put some thought into it before making yeah. this attack. So Zoe can what trade with the Bone Crusher here, or just eat up the the Blood Tithe Harvester, and it's going to be eat the Harvester. So we know that the Fatal Push now could could take it out, although obviously Zoe doesn't know that, and Rush is not, not going to mess with that either. And uh, is that another Storm the Festival? So, oh, man. Oh, All man. All right. Well, there's, I, yeah, that's that's just going to be really hard to beat. I mean, for the rest of the turn, Zoe gets to just cast these, and if they're, I mean, if it's not complete blanks, then Roger has to be in big trouble. Yeah, let's see what we have. This one's looking pretty weak. And okay. That wasn't, that wasn't the best. Uh, in exciting. fact, it was probably considerably lower than even that much. So, uh, so we can pick up a land here and and a Kiora. All right, Kiora, Wolf Will Haven, uh, sure. Wolf Will Haven, okay. Yeah. Adds and more devotion and mana, so definitely better yeah. than a land. Right, right. No, it, this is, yeah. Okay, she's not done for the turn. She, uh, she taps the land. She's got a Karyatid, I think. 
Okay. Ooh, Carrington, another good pickup. That means it's going to be pretty easy to preserve this Kiora mm -hmm. around the removal spell that we know about from Raja. Of course, <laughs> Carrington having Hexproof mattering a bunch here, and even more so with Liliana the Veil yeah. to draw. You can't even clear the whole field and uh, clear Kiora. If you could, then that would be great. But yeah, look, get a look at Carrington there. Uh, standard All Star in its time. Defender Hexproof. And as a man of any color, you know, bolting the bird, a big part of magic heuristics, this bird unable to be bolted. And so mattering quite a bit right here, right now in 2023. This, this Liliana here. Okay. So Liliana plus push. I mean, Karyatid would probably get sacrificed. Uh, yeah. How, ugh. this is not the greatest Liliana of all time. No, it's not. <laughs> and yeah. If, if Zoe elects to, clear the the old girl troll then she gets to choose like it's not roger that gets the decision with fatal push right. Right? she gets to choose which object to keep in play and mm -hmm. i think that's giving your opponent options traditionally not great but maybe either one's good for roger he's definitely putting some some time in the tank as well and i'm very glad it's him that has to make this this decision <laughs> under high pressure and not me he is doing a big think. Yeah, we're going to start here with, with Liliana. I think that's where it has to start. It's the only card with text. Now we have to decide, is the card in hand better than the Edict? It is not. So are we going to get rid of Karyatid? And still not willing to Fatal Push. Willing to just offer the trade. And the trade is going to go through. Have to imagine that was at Kiora? Maybe would... not. I don't think Kiora look... updated. Oh, oh yeah, there, there it is. Okay. Okay. All right, well, Zoe with all sorts of mana this turn, and we know Storm of the Festival in the Graveyard, Storm of the Festival in hand. Elvish Mystic, I think, free to deploy the pickup. Sure. I mean, if that's the Fatal Push, I don't think Zoe's going to mind too much, knowing Raja would be empty <laughs> Yeah, I, I think if that's getting Fatal Push, you have to be pumping your fist. That yeah. is a really poor target this late in the game when Zoe's mana situation is more than solved. All right, taking a count there of how much mana this Nyctos is going to make. Looks like three, four, five, six, seven. So if the mana is available, do you flash back or do you cast a fresh one from hand knowing there's Liliana in play? I suppose you go from the hand, even it's though... a little bit of math, right? Because if, if you hit another Nyctos, is that yeah. good enough to go again? If the answer is no, then you want to be the most mana efficient, which involves using one out of the graveyard. But if you... And if you're going to lose it anyway to Liliana, maybe the answer oh. is just go out of the hand anyway. And that one is oh. a hit. Yeah, so so he has options here. It's just going to be Karn plus Old Growth Troll number two. And yeah, yeah okay. Karn wow. plus Old Growth Troll added to the mix. And a card coming, thanks to the Kiora, before anything else really even happens. Karn sitting at five loyalty. We'll see if there's any way we can go again. <laughs> Zoe doing a little bit of Nykthos math, I think. Is Kiora not activated yet? Can up to untap this Nykthos. And make a whole boo cool's amount of mana. Let's see, we got one, two, three, four, plus what plus three? Oh geez, this is just so much. And yeah, we are going to fire off the fatal push now on the Elvish Mystic. No longer has revolt, so cannot actually push the old girl troll to cut off a bunch of mana. Had that option last turn, chose not to. You know, and now maybe a little bit punished because you, you're constricting less mana by fatal did, pushing the mystic versus the old girl troll now that did, you don't have revolt anymore. Did he have that option last turn? Yeah, I mean, we lost the Bone Crusher Giant, right? We had Revolt. Uh, but then there was nothing. But there was nothing left to kill at that point, right? The. Uh, well, she sacked the carry, did, right? She down ticked on carry to. Oh, oh, I see. I see. We didn't have Revolt until after. Yeah. Know, never mind. I'm yeah. just wrong. Yeah. So Fatal Push actually just looking embarrassing. Though. Yeah. Yeah. So Fatal Push. push a... Yeah. Fatal Push just didn't look. I don't think there was even a window for Raj to use the Fatal Push to, in the last couple of turns, too much effect. Now, we lost that Blood Tithe Harvester yeah, two that, turns ago, yeah, and that would have given Revolt. And I, yeah. if he saw that Blood Token hanging around, maybe we had that option. That's not really great either. I, maybe we can find out from the spotter. I feel like the Blood Token was used almost immediately for a Swamp, and I think that one is just kind of... Yeah, it's like hanging out there next to Liliana. There, Hard to tell yeah, exactly where that is. Maybe we can find out is. from the table, but I don't think that's actually either way, in play. Yeah. I don't Our, know that any of these roads led to Rome anyway. No, I don't like, think so all either. All this is I don't, literal semantics when yeah. <laughs> she just has... Zoe just has a reign of Storm the Festivals coming down mm -hmm. both from hand and graveyard yeah so that yeah. that elf had to have been the draw from the kiora to replace the one there yeah so raja's like okay i'll use my one removal spell to kill an elf it's always like cool i just get an elf for free to replace it and in the meantime <laughs> leveler. leveler sure good luck <laughs>
Yeah, all right. Maybe we don't even need to start the vessels. Maybe we just put this giant artifact in play, and that's going to be good enough. I think most roads lead to Rome. There is maybe some some draw steps you need to consider that Raja could if he could just tutor a card every turn for the rest of the game. But uh, gosh, I, I'm not sure there's any outs from yeah. here. No Why right. no, Raja so. agrees. We're going to pick him up. Okay, so Zoe Reberman will win the Pioneer match, or will win this Pioneer match. And, okay. And we are going to go ahead and, and now present decks for modern for match number three. So, so most matches possible being played here. Yeah. And as a requirement, the uh, format has to flip. So we can't do mm -hmm. Pioneer again. We have to play the modern matchup. And I believe Raja is going to get to choose play draw once again. So right. hard to hate Raja's spot here. But, you know, clearly both players, <laughs> for better or for worse, interested in playing Pioneer on the play Maybe that's a little bit of a downside, but uh, either way, Azorius mm -hmm. Control versus Living End is what we're going to see. Uh, Living End, of course, been uh, Zoe's weapon of choice throughout a lot of the year in the NRG series. We've seen her uh, at least one top eight with the deck and playing it very, very uh, proficiently. Mm -hmm. And the only player showing up with it here to the NRG Championship. Meanwhile, Raja, one among many of control players in our very, very... Uh, control laden modern format here at the championship event yeah you see there at the bottom of the screen a judge or the spotter showing raja asking for the text of colossal sky turtle looked like which is a one of in zoe's list all right raja let's take a mulligan if we have the deck list available let's go and take a look at the deck list before we had started on the modern match here we have bank control from raja we know the opponent playing living end uh chalice avoid and teferi i mean those are some serious obstacles yeah, Chalice of the Void, certainly one of the, and they know the matchup, right? Yes. So Chalice of the Void, the best of the bunch. You can deploy it on turn zero. There's no way for, you know, Zoe to really get around that one. Like, it's like Force of Negation or Bust basically right there on turn one. But Teferi, just as good at shutting down the uh, the Cascade effects. Mm -hmm. So like you called out, those are going to be the most important cards. But the counterspells matter too, yeah. right? Like, being able to just fight the Living End on the counterspell axis is harder but not nothing. It's not impossible. Right. All right. Let's hit Zoe's deck real quick as it looks like Raj is contemplating a six card hand. And you see here uh, what he was looking at asking about the Colossal Sky Turtle. That is something that can channel and bounce uh, as well as there's a pair of Ottawara. So there are ways to get Chalice off the board if it lands. But clearly Zoe would prefer to either have Force Litigation or for Raj to just not draw those cards whatsoever. Yeah. He is yeah. Or just her to be able to catch them with grief, right? Yeah. Like, just don't yeah, that would work too. One or whatever. Let me grief it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there it is. That's exactly what's going to happen here. All right. So it is uh, Zoe on the play here. And it is again, Zoe on the play, yeah. can we update the archetypes, please, on the screen? We are playing modern. We are in game number one of Blue Eye Control Final versus match, match Living End. Yeah. yeah. So this will be the determining match to see who faces Jesse Robkin in the finals. And the choice with grief is, well, the cards that Zoe doesn't want to see are not there in hand. They're not present right now. Yeah, I mean, if you're Zoe Reederman, I feel like you have to be really excited to see that mm -hmm. hand. No Teferis, no Chalice, and your first counterspell now is going to come down on turn three. You're more or less in the clear to just play your game plan. And we'll see, you know, exactly if Zoe can, can leverage that fact before Roger finds a way to draw out of it. It doesn't look like Zoe had too many cyclers in the hand, but maybe just a pair of uh, of griefs of is going to be good enough yeah. to bring back and flip the game. We'll see exactly maybe. how that plays out. I mean, drawing another... A uh, black card, or maybe there is one already in hand. I'm not <laughs> sure. Is there a street wraith? Yeah. So okay. Well, another grief followed by two griefs coming back into play. I mean, that is pretty huge. Raja does have a solitude, I think. So he wouldn't get yeah, completely. Yeah, Raja does have a solitude. I don't think he has a white card to pair with it. So right mm -hmm. now, it's uh, gonna be slow to operate. Mm -hmm. And the draw was ley line. Look at the draw. It was a ley line binding, I believe, which isn't gonna help much either. Also, it's not gonna be in hand very long. Yeah, yeah, we'll see exactly what happens here. Maybe there's an argument to Leyline binding the uh that's about to come down, but we're gonna see a cycle instead. Yeah, so interesting. Zoe's so not gonna bother with the grief, it's just, just gonna cycle the street wraith and like you're saying, trying to put more cards in the graveyard. And now Waker of Waves is the draw. That would be ideal to already have in the graveyard, but that's not the case. So it's an interesting spot here. Do you yeah. just go for it knowing that Archmage's Charm is on the horizon? Or do you wake her of waves and try to start fighting on the counterspell axis? I think this is the question Zoe's gonna have to answer right now. Mm -hmm. As she and looks at her hand, and, including Charlotte's Agent. And it's hard to fight because it because it's Charlotte's Agent and not Violent Opera. She can't just hope to find force of negation and then you know fight and get the living end through. That doesn't work on her own turn. So it is just gonna be Charlotte's Agent here. 
Yeah, Charlotte's agent indeed. And we're seeing, I think there's a cascade trigger on the stack. Roger's mm -hmm. doing a little bit of thinking. Yeah. I, no, we know he has access to solitude and potentially leyline binding. You can mm -hmm. fetch the, the tap lands and make it cost one, but I don't know exactly what we're going to be thinking about here. So if you're grief, certainly a problem coming back. The rest of it's kind of slow. Yeah. Yeah, this is not the, the best living end of all time. So what Roger's maybe contemplating here is if you just pitch cast Solitude right now, which has nothing to kill, at least be in the graveyard, and it'll come back in from the living end and pick off one of the creatures. Yeah, and stay in play, right? And stay and in play, right. Life yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, well, he... It looks like the rest of the card... looks. Oh, he's like, okay, go ahead and cascade. That's not going to make any... Imp difference I may as well let you do it now while i think about this and i do i do like that there are you know on all sorts of you know magic formats and games where it's like okay i'm, I'm having trouble making a decision i'm gonna let you continue with something that you know isn't doesn't really impact it so i can buy more time to think about this well also like you just you all also want to make sure so he puts it on the stack right like if you go hemorrhaging cards left and right i suppose just, like preparing for this living end they can just be like, oh, so can be like oh okay i'm not gonna cast it <laughs> you don't want that to happen so yeah. just make sure it goes to the stack too mm -hmm. All right, randomize the flip over cards there. They go to the bottom. And then, yeah, so this living end will enter the stack. And then it's decision time for Raja. And it looks like this living end resolved. And it sure did. And living end happened. We brought back Street Wraith Grief. I assume that trigger is on the stack mm -hmm. as we are fetching. Likely going to make a move here. All right, so the options based on what cards we know, it could be Leyline Binding. It could be... I mean, it wouldn't make much sense for Raja to decide to Solitude now, so he's clearly chosen not to do it. Yeah, I think we might be Leyline Binding here. Sure. Off of, I, think this, I think we're looking at Rafine's Tower and Ketria Triome, which means mm -hmm. that we do have all five types, and it is a one-mana spell. So we're going to go ahead and cast the Leyline Binding. I think the best... I mean, Swamp Walk is active, you know? <laughs> so it is unblockable if that's part of your plan, but Menace mm -hmm. is also hard to block. Both three power creatures. Not sure the best one to hit. Probably the Wraith. That Probably. way, if the, there is some way to remove the binding. You don't get another ETB trigger. That's that is certainly true. But it, it's close. It really depends on what you're trying to, how you're trying to answer the rest of the board. Because now that they're in play, you have to find a, a way to answer the creatures that are in play. Mm -hmm. We'll see exactly what that's going to look like. All right. So right. Archmage, Charm, Solitude, and two land. Zoe likely to choose the Charm here, not wanting to put free creatures into Raja's graveyard. Right? Well, unless she thinks she can win with this without casting. Yeah, if this is just end. good enough, right? Yeah. This is a this is a four turn clock. We yeah. might just be done here. Be like, okay, take your Solitude. I'm not going to cast a spell for the rest of the game. Please never draw something. Yeah, like, draw no cards that matter. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> that would be that's a reasonable thought process. That's not what Zoe's going to choose. She is going to choose the Charm. Probably better. Hedging your bets, I think, makes a lot more sense. Not mm -hmm. either, either way, I think Raj is in a lot of trouble. Yeah. But something like a Teferi into a white card could start to add to the mix. And a white card was drawn. Prismatic ending. All right. Prismatic ending can't take out the Charlotte's agent. That's not, you know, the way you draw things up when you're putting your deck together. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's what I mean, Raj... It does take a lot off the clock. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's what Raj is being presented with right now. So, living in not yeah. generally great at following up by hard casting additional creatures although i mean courier mystery sometimes occasionally does make it into play and say he's going to pick up oh never mind he's just i guess putting no he okay he picked up kahira picked from up the and companion zone. Kahira. yeah okay, okay yeah so kahira yeah. was in the companion zone announced it was off screen a little bit yeah uh, we went ahead and picked that one up to hand and solituded right away now a lonely charlotte's agent left behind the shields are down uh, if if Zoe can assemble eat, like another small living end or what have you, but Solitude being in the graveyard for Raja could pose a big problem to that particular game plan. Mm -hmm. And maybe we're going to see hard cast curator mystery. I, I think we are. I think that would be a, an excellent decision here for Zoe. It also makes, I mean, the seldom seen um, actual ability on curator mysteries would. Oh no, she's not going to do it. I take. I'm sorry. I yeah, well, she kind has, of she good options, right? Awaker yeah. of Waves for a little bit of cantrip action sure. can start to overpower the solitude as far as getting a big enough living in for it to matter. And I think another white card drawn for Raja looks like oh no, it's the same one. We still we still have prismatic and he just pulled that to the front. Mm -hmm. So didn't get a great look at the draw. Yeah, it looks like two lands the rest of the yeah. cards. So board clear, but Raja's sitting on two lands and no tricks, right? No companions, no things in exile, no more, no more resources. We literally just lands in the top of the deck. 
Meanwhile, Zoe, quite a bit more than that, as Waker of the Wave is going to get cycled, and that gives that powerful ability to look at the top two, put one in the yard, the other one in the hand. One of those was a force. Okay, force goes to the graveyard. Huh? Interested. Shardless Agent picked up. Interesting. There's Shields are down, so maybe it's just time for... I mean, Shardless Agent is so tough. Waker Waves... It's going to be Shardless Agent. All right, so imagine we're going to cycle this Curator once the Living End's found. She doesn't want to actually draw the Living End the last second. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I, was like I, I wonder if we're supposed to cycle first because what if we get another Cycler? But yeah, no, Zoe, obviously much better Living End than me. It's like, well, if I draw Living End, that's really bad, especially this <laughs> matchup where you can run out of Living Ends. Mm -hmm. You know, if they all get countered, you start playing uh, Draft Chaff Tribal here, trying to beat, it, beat down. So instead going to wait to cycle until after the living is already on the stack and you still have the same the same kind of option where if you draw another cycler you're good to go right okay so currently we're bringing back what waker which is probably gonna get tagged by the solitude and then this curator that will be coming in and uh is there another card in the graveyard under the living end actually i'm sure there isn't because that wouldn't make any sense no i don't think so yeah i yeah. think the graveyard is otherwise entirely cleared out See exactly. <laughs> Roger, getting a good look at the cards that are now gone through. Of course, the deck lists are open, but what's important here is that these cards are going to get shuffled put on the bottom. I and mean, we see the Colossal mm -hmm. Sky Turtle uh, being noted there by Raja. I, I yeah. like I like looking at the cards anyway. I like that a lot from Raja, noting that Sky Turtle not in hand and specifically not in the top whatever 10 yeah. of the cards of her I mean, library either. That is a one-off. So that yeah, he does know now. I mean, there's no reason not to pick up all information you can, and he knows that she is not does not have and is unlikely to draw. In fact, cannot draw a Colossal Sky Turtle for the next, I don't know, 15 turns. And here comes that cycle that you called out, post living end being on the stack, land the draw. Not exciting, but some some big monsters coming back. Uh, certainly cards that can overpower the Solitude, which is going to come back and probably remove the Waker Waves. I think that one's like a 7-7. Seven, seven. Mm -hmm. Going to be the biggest by far. I have to imagine. But the, the Flyer, also kind of relevant. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. going to go ahead and get rid of that Waker Waves. That thing is so big. And effectively have put a curator of mysteries, a Charlotte's agent and solitude back into play. We'll see exactly if that's going to work out for Zoe Reederman as Teferi picked up. So good thing that Zoe did not wait on mm -hmm. that living end because this Teferi going to make future living ends if there are any left hard to work as here comes the Teferi and picking up either of these creatures is just kind of fine for Zoe, right? Like you just recast it. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. So maybe, maybe Roger picks up his own solitude. Nope, Curator, back to him. That's the Curator. Now, uh, Raja could attack, I suppose. Well, now that you're giving up to Fairy, you're definitely not going to want to do that. So, yeah, I'd probably just hang back. Yeah, definitely want to hang back here. And, I mean, it's weird to say it, but Zoe having resolved two living ends, Raja feels ahead. Yeah, well, these were not, like, impressive living ends, really. There just wasn't that much stuff in the graveyard. These weren't games where Zoe was, Zoe was able to cycle you know, half a dozen times first. All right, here's the trade-off for the Solitude, which goes back to the graveyard, which is not really where Zoe... I mean, you don't want it in play, obviously, but you don't really want it in the graveyard either. I mean, I think if there are any future living ends, it's going to be a living end for so big that Solitude yeah. no longer matters. We kind of already did the short up small living ends, and Ch Chalice is going to shut down all future living ends. I think with six lands in play for Zoe and multiple problems for the actual living ends themselves active, that even if she has more living ends available, we're just still on hard cast the creatures mode. Oh, we're yeah. just casting the mopey creatures for the rest of the game and hoping that uh, Roger runs out of stuff before Zoe does. I mean, I think and is, to pick up. is the last card in hand, I think, is it the Leyline Binding? I mean, this is, sure is this is Zoe's now, you know, two levels of defense for Raja. Zoe, you're right, is on hardcast of creatures. That's all she's going to be able to do. Yeah, and, well, I mean, she has two Charlotte's agents. So, you know, the board's clear. Raja, once again, empty handed. But, you know, Zoe is going to be able to put uh, enough power to clear the Teferi next turn yeah. into play this turn if she chooses to cast both, uh, both Charlotte's agents. Of course, living in, not going to function. But even if you had one, I'm not sure you'd even cast it here. Yeah, I mean, very, very underwhelming. You're 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 right. And if she does have two Charlotte's agents, yeah, I don't think she has a choice. I guess there's a there is the uh grief in hand still. So but yeah, that just doesn't seem I mean, yeah, right, I, I think hard. we're shortcutting yeah. here saying yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe All there's right, no more living ends too. So she's like, I'm shuffling my deck twice, and yeah, yeah. Roger gonna take a whole look through the deck, and yeah, I think that means there's no more living ends at all, which doesn't matter, but I mean I guess it's actually good. They're bad draw steps here. Well, there's so, no, there could be living ends, so he's just gonna oh you're right, because otherwise it would stop. No, yeah, he's looking yeah, at the whole yeah, deck, you're right. Yeah, you're right. There yeah. are no no more living ends. 
So we're on what a pair of tutus and attackers. It's always like, yeah, versus <laughs> it's a pair, yeah. This is the way I planned it. I don't want living ends because I can't resolve them anyway. So they may as well not even be in there at this point. I was just like, all wow. right, let me just get a look at you know everything you have available. Yeah, just kind of doing counts on what's left. I mean, it's the main deck game, so you, you can basically calculate. I think you could actually try to figure out exactly what Zoe's card in hand is, which is what Roger's doing here, because deck lists are open. You know all of the cards in our library, you know, play, exile, what have you. So we're trying to figure out what exactly the last card in Zoe's hand is, given that it is more or less face up. I don't know if Zoe's, you know, I can't hear what the players are saying if she's going to reveal what that is, but that's why Roger's taking so much time looking through information he theoretically already knows is mm -hmm. there is some stuff that can be derived here. And a land to pick up for Raja, that's really good if you're a Zoe fan. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's playing Social Colonnade anymore. Uh, so <laughs> lands are not it. a problem. I mean, Social Colonnade would dominate the board right now. but uh... <laughs> So big. Sarah Angel on a land? Are you joking? <laughs> Draw step for Zoe. Didn't get a great look. And I have to imagine that's coming at Teferi. Yeah, no more cards for you, please. Also, you know, maybe some of my cards actually work. Things like Force Negations or what have you. White card picked up of some kind. Have to imagine that's a prismatic ending. <laughs> okay. Three mana answer at 2-2. Two -two. Gray Ogres versus Maelstrom Pulse. So this is tough. All right. Land, so, or vindicate, really. A land would get... I think Zoe has Striped Riverwinder in hand. Didn't cycle it. Hoping to draw a land. Didn't. Uh, also has Architects of Will just drawn. Can't cast that either. You have to imagine Ooh. we're interested in cycling that Curator one. Curator works. Not yet castable. Curator of Mysteries yeah. definitely castable. So big. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. like a legitimate like creature. A 4 4 flyer? Yeah. Yeah, and then the scries can help find your next land. Yeah, look at this thing. This is one of the cool cards in this deck that uh, you can cast actually very easily. It is only four mana, and it's a 4 4 flyer. Really big. You mentioned 4 4 flyers looking good here. Archmage's Charm found and immediately cashed in for two cards for Raja Sulman. And yeah, no, you also get that little bit of scry action, which you have plenty of cycles and discards to do with that. Cool stuff. <coughs> All right. So does Zoe cycle and get the scry bonus, or do you just hope to draw a land and get that striped riverwinder out there? That may depend on the remains of Raja's turn, which I, I think I looked away for a second. It looked like he considered fetching with those double flood strands and then may have changed his mind. Uh, it would take a fair amount of damage, and maybe he's going to save. If that is a prismatic ending, he might be thinking, maybe I should save that for the curator next turn. Yeah. God, this is tough. Because, yeah, hitting the curator is big game. It's by far the biggest thing on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. But, you know, who knows what Zoe's going to add to the battlefield next turn and how much mana you're going to have to tie up on the next turn, too, based on, like... Because you have to draw something, right? Raj is going to need help from the top of the deck in order to, to win this game. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, that's going to require mana, whatever that help looks like. So cashing in mana now, that's why you want to be mana efficient in any game of Magic the Gathering. But particularly so for Raja right now, it's like, all right, you know, if I move now, my next turn, I could end up taxed on mana, even though I have six lands in play. And that's never really where you want to be. As I think a, I didn't get a great look at what was actually picked up there. It's attack for six is coming across. Mm -hmm. Oh, Violent Outburst. We got a Trumpet Blast ready to go. Hey, I mean, that might, you, you know, the way it may come down to that. It comes up all the time, actually. Yeah. I, I feel like every time I watch this deck get played, it's like, all right, well, yeah, this Trumpet Blast is going to be huge. All right. If you're wondering, if you uh, weren't here when we went over the deck list before, and you're wondering on the Supreme Verdict count in Roger Sluman's deck, it is zero. So That's a big game. The best draws for him at the moment are probably copies of Solitude, maybe Planeswalkers, but Solitude seems like the ideal pickup during most points in time of this game, and maybe even of this match, Chalice, are the, the living already locked out and actually already gone? I suppose if... Yeah, it's not even in the equation anymore. Yeah. And subtlety picked up, it looks like? Okay. All right. That can... Uh, well, that's going to be uh, an unfortunate Smaller. surprise. <laughs> Deploying now. Uh, here we go. Yeah, here comes Prismatic Ending. That one's going to munch up that Curator Mysteries. And a passing of the turn. Charlotte Station can untap once again. Life total still very high. Mm -hmm. Another Striped River Wonder, I think. Maybe it's time to start cycling those. Not totally sure. Nope, not interested, says Zoe Reederman, as another land drawn for Raja. And the subtlety is going to be worth a little bit, right? Like being able to stop the Striped River Winder onslaught as soon as they it starts. Yeah. You can keep one of them out of, what out would of play be, for a turn. What would it, It'll be interesting to see when the next Shardless Agent attack here, because the, the subtlety could come in to block it. And then in that case, the Trumpet Blast would be able to dispatch it. So he draws the land. Uh, yeah, so Raja... 
there's no information available to him on what might be going on here. But okay, here is the subtlety. So okay, now Zoe cashing it out. Wow. Do, does Zoe cast the outburst? No, she's going to let the Charles agent die in order to get these Riverwinders on the board. Yeah, I mean, I like it, right? Yeah. Just like you have two of them start this. Like Roger, it's actually really low, right? Down to eight. So over the next like three turns, these Riverwinders, I mean, I, don't they have hexproof? Like yes. once they're in play, they're basically just going to stay in play. Yeah, they, and that's going to be a huge problem for Roger. Yeah, in fact, there are they cannot be. Re- I guess dressed down in combination with something else. Otherwise, this uh, draft playable uh, is going <laughs> to start being very threatening for Roger Sullivan here. This is not going to be easy to answer. Yeah, Hexproof, a very annoying mechanic for the Zero Sweeper Blue Eye Tech. And another land, wow. certainly not helping. Top of the deck being pretty brutal to Raja here. Game number one in this matchup is Subtlety. Gonna get aggressive. Yeah, I'm sure a Zoe, He's not blocking. Zoe is <laughs> thrilled. She's like, whatever you have, the fact that you're attacking me is tremendous. Please yeah. do that again. A uh, couple Raja of takes one here. of the three different lands in hand to yeah. play. Does so, passes the turn back. Zoe quickly untapping. Have to imagine she's excited to untap with this monstrous five five that's going to rumble across the red zone, putting Raja down to three. Yeah, and with another River Wonder to come. I mean, you can check, concentrate. Like, okay, how many sweepers are in your deck? Well, I've seen your deck list. As long as I was paying attention to this aspect of it, I know there's no sweepers. So let's run out the other one. Do you have a counter? Yep. You do not. <laughs> Raja Suleiman, you're done. Uh, yeah, you better... you're dead. And uh, yeah, another <laughs> land. Roger's like, yeah, are you kidding? I just drew all lands the entire game. And uh, yeah, yeah, Zoe, despite resolving multiple living ends, looking like it wasn't going to be good enough. Roger, at the end, we said it multiple times, going to need help from the top of the deck, did not find it. Zoe, able to pick up game number one and match number three here yeah. in the semifinals of this NRG championship event. And that could have gone either way there for a while. Zoe took a couple turns to draw land number seven. If Roger had found a counter before that, that could have gone differently. Uh, if the salty hadn't been committed to the board to trade off to eat up the Charlie's agent, I mean, that play made sense. He right. could have waited for a creature. He could have waited to play at the end of the turn and had man up. Almost the troubling aspect was with no other spells in hand, it's hard to justify to yourself. I should keep mana untapped. And uh, yeah. and it went badly. Uh, so, all right, let's go ahead and bring the deck list back up again so we can see the players consulting their sideboards. We again, after those 75 card mirrors in the other semifinal, it's nice to see actual, you know, Different, different cards to yeah, look at. <laughs> against each other here. So um, for Raja, it's got to be somewhat discouraging to lose game one when, I mean, you basically have six super strong hate cards for your opponent in the main deck. Yeah, it definitely. I think Zoe definitely very interested in winning game one here. Mm. I mean, there's we mentioned there's a ton of hate already in the main deck with the Chalices and Teferis, but I mean, look at these. You got four Endurances and like additional help with like counter spells and removal spells in the sideboard available. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be tough yes. to navigate through these sideboard games, I think, for Zoe. She's going to have to come very prepared with her sideboarding. But the four Endurances, maybe... I mean, look at the green card count yeah. of Raja's deck. Definitely going to have to look to buy Kahira as his turn three play. Uh, in basically all of these sideboard games. Otherwise, these endurances are not likely to have a green card to pitch. No, that's yeah. specifically Kahira, which ties them up on turn three. Yeah, buying Kahira or hard casting, that's that's the way that I guess you could draw right. more than one endurance. But yeah, these are not going to be cheated into play very often. Which is way better on the play than the draw. But I yeah. imagine they're coming in either yeah. way. <laughs> so that's basically, I'm sure, what they're here for. Uh, some of these planeswalkers that are a little higher. On, on curve, maybe you're a little less interested in brokers, charms, dress downs. You know, those cards also seem a little bit of weak, uh, weaker than some of the other options we have here. So, I, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, Dovin's Veto, additional counter spells, endurance, definitely the big key card out of the sideboard for Raja. So, some, some relatively large adjustments being made, but nothing like warping as far as the strategy goes. There's yeah. no sweepers coming in. There's no, like, we're still very much looking to interact in this one for one basis, but endurance is going to help level the playing field as far as graveyard interaction goes. Yeah. How good are these one for ones? I mean, maybe Raja would take out some copies of his targeted removal. I mean, Prismatic, Indy, Leyline, Binding aren't super uh, here when you're yeah, facing down. Yeah. The uh, subtleties and solitudes are great because they come back. Yeah. But the, the cards that don't think, especially Prismatic ending, when the creatures cost like seven or whatever, yeah. maybe yeah. a little underwhelming. All right. Let's go ahead and look at uh, Zoe's deck list and sideboard uh more copies of endurance here same as her deck less valuable although i mean maybe there's a scenario where she wants to endurance raja to get solitudes out of the graveyard maybe she wants to endurance herself to shuffle living ends back in the deck as we saw they can run out but uh 
Yeah, I mean, I don't hate either of that. Like, no. I don't know if you want both, but like having yeah. one just to be like, okay, you know, you're definitely boarding in the fourth live again because once again, you don't want to get ca- taxed out of counter spells and all that kind of stuff, what have you. You want to be able to keep the living in train going turn after turn after turn. And eventually, like you mentioned, Roger could start to build up solitudes and stuff in the graveyard to where the living don't look as good. So endurance, a fine flash attacker anyway, also can represent bringing your living back or clearing the graveyard. I think that has to be above the bar. And mm-hmm. uh, things like the um mystical disputes to fight on counter spells definitely interesting but the problem here for zoe and this is something we brought up is you don't want to dilute your game plan yeah but also you're being fought on two axes you're being fought on the one for one counter spells in your living end axis but you're also being fought on the permanent based axis with things like teferi and chalice so you have those two different things to cover and you don't have any one card that covers all of it yeah. So you kind of have to pick you know how much of this foundation breaker brazen borrower besage you stuff do you want uh, and what angle do you want to take? Decklists are open. She knows about all of it. She just has to kind of pick her angle. And, you know, Zoe has done a great job of that throughout the NRG series. And, you know, maybe we can get a little more insight after the fact, what have you, as to how she's sideboarding. But I think it's a tall task. And certainly play draw is going to depend a lot on what she does because endurance, like we mentioned, is on the table for turn three with Raja on the play. Mm-hmm. But maybe Zoe can get underneath Raja when it comes to Raja being on the draw because he won't have his endurance up quite yet until turn three. So she can go for that turn three living end. Yeah, no, that's totally reasonable. And yeah, I mean, this is, I agree. This is, this looks very tough for the living end deck. However, game one also looked tough and she got that one. Yeah. So she <laughs> just, just cast the creatures, whatever, yeah. you know, all this unfair stuff. Fine. I won't fight you. I'll play fair. When I play fair, you still can't beat me. So let's do it. Yeah. And, you know, she only, did a great job of that in game. She one. only needs one out of two here. I mean, she doesn't have to win both. Uh, and which means Raja, you're talking a lot about how picking up Kahir to enable endurance. Raja has to win a game where he can't do that. Right. So, yeah, that is, that is the ability that Zoe has earned by winning game one here. And we are in match number three at the second semifinal. We'll see. Uh, looks like sideboarding is still going on. But uh, yeah, if you're enjoying a lot, a lot this. I'm looking at deck lists, and, all right, so it makes sense. Okay, one of the players has gone to the restroom, so this is going to be a couple minutes here. But uh, while we're waiting, well, thank you for being here. And we'll put up the schedule for the beginning of next year again. If you want to mark your calendar, if you want to come out to some of the Rage events, if you want to watch here on twitch.tv slash energy series, you can see the upcoming um, March, May, and June events. Uh, a couple in Mundelein, Illinois, and one in Minneapolis. Formats will be uh, chosen fairly soon, and that will be locked away. Uh, I think you can continue. You can expect to see... Uh, a decent amount more of Modern and Pioneer. Those are the formats that the Rage series has primarily shifted towards. We did have some Legacy this year, and we had some Sealed, but Constructive Format, Constructive Magic appears to be what the players are looking for. Modern and Pioneer seem to be primarily where that go- that's going on, so you can expect the formats are likely to consist of that. A change for next year's events from this year. Next This year, the quarterly showdown events directly qualified players to the championship next year every saturday main event will qualify the winner for the championship at the end of the year oh, so wow. that That's will be different change. yeah so the yeah. there will still be um at large points bids at the end of the year to fill out the field but there are more opportunities to directly qualify next year so just throwing that information out there if that puts you over the fence uh if you're not sure whether you're gonna go like okay i don't know if it's worth the drive maybe it is maybe it isn't anyway lots more there will be more Exciting announcements. I'm not allowed to talk about them yet, but the series <laughs> next year, there there are going to be some cool features. So uh, stick around, follow us on Twitter, follow us here on Twitch, and stay apprised of all the goings on at NerdRage Gaming. Drake Saster, semifinals. Game ma- match number three of the semifinals. Match three. I mean, these players have got to be feeling this at this point, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this tournament is a marathon. We, you know, you had a ton of magic to play day one. Then you had to go to sleep. Uh, high level magic. You have to play your best every single round. You're not yeah. playing against, you get no freebies. There's no freebies in any of these rounds. These are the best of the best. So, you know, playing against all these great players day one, day two, it's more of the same. And now your top four is even more of a marathon because you can't just win one match. Mm-hmm. You need to win two out of three matches to proceed. And we know that Jesse Robkin has already done a great job of that. Gets a little bit of a break because yes, she was yes. able to borrow. That's a little bit of the value of being able to just run your opponent over as you get a little bit of a break to rest. And, you know, the winner of this match here, because we are down to the final match of this particular set, is going to advance to the, the finals where Jesse is waiting to face them down and is going to be flesh, 
freshly refreshed uh, after her break. So Dude, you can't no, do that to the English tough. language. It's but, tough. Uh, look, English language, I mean, we already don't get along great. <laughs> and as soon as you start doing that kind of alliteration and stuff, everything breaks down. Nothing works. I, I just don't know what you want from me. But yeah, so Jesse has been able to rest, maybe get something to eat, uh, just spend time. Maybe she's burning this match right now. We don't know. But these matches did start at the same time. It was considered whether the, the semifinal start should be staggered. Uh, the decision was made to start them at the same time. Uh, Jesse's match just took that much less time. I mean, she just... Yeah. Foro swept Andrew Ellen Bogan and was out of here. She's probably been done for about half an hour now, waiting for um, the outcome of this match, which, okay, the players are presenting. Let's go back down to the table. And here we go. This is game number two, of course. Raja losing game one, going to be on the play. And I think in this particular matchup, post board play draw matters a ton i mean you we called it out look endurance already in the hand that one's going to be online for turn three mm -hmm. but just being able to buy kahiro which we see over there in the companion zone this and teferi too right like these all these three mana hate cards are now functional whereas on the draw zoe can get underneath mm -hmm. and that matters so so much now of course zoe not dead in the water has some free spells of her own things like grief things like force of negation that can certainly still play but it, it is a lot harder for zoe to be able to just you know 2-0 sweep raja here this is going to be an uphill battle and raja give it a big think here i think he may need a third land mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, uh, so he's caving. Zoe's Zoe. getting he's going to six. <clears throat> so it'd be interesting when Raja gets to turn three, assuming he has the three land, he can cast a fairy. He can just pick up a Kahira. Casting a fairy is probably easier for Zoe to deal with, uh, as in addition to force of negation handling it, also subtlety. Subtlety is both endurance and to fairy. But, and even something like grief, right, doesn't yeah. do a great job of handling endurance either. Where you can, yeah, you can clear it out the way, but Raja can still just cast it, and then your plan mm -hmm. of living end is just way worse because now Raja also gets an endurance, and uh, you know you only get a grief back. So I think endurance probably going to be the play that Raja's looking for on turn three. And but if you're Zoe and you see Raja just slam put Kahira in his hand on turn three, I think the you know the gig's up. You kind of yeah. know what's going on. You don't mm -hmm. even need a grief to know that the endurance is there. Yeah. And it's tough here for Zoe. Okay, Zoe looks like she is keeping six. It's tough, I imagine, because it's a hard matchup, because you need so many things and there's so many things you're afraid of. Like you don't want to mulligan too far because you need a lot of cards to win, but you also you need you need answers to things. So it's hard to keep I, I imagine the mulligan decisions in this matchup in cyborg games for living end deck are fairly difficult. Absolutely. I, I mean, I can't agree with you more. Part of me kind of wonders too, is if Zoe is going to start prioritizing in like specifically this game, just having a bunch of lands. Cause if you're that far behind on trying to cheat, you know, trying to, you know, be able to do your powerful living in thing, maybe mm -hmm. you just abandon it entirely. And be like, whatever, I'm not going to make a move ever. I'm just going to make land drops. And I'm going to cast a big creature every turn until you die. Yeah. I mean, that is, Especially because Raja doesn't have access to sweepers, that is certainly possible. It's tough though, without I don't well, I don't I don't let me let me consult Zoe's deck list again. I don't know if she has the ability to hard cast any of the black creatures. I think she may not. Well, let's check. Usually they play like one filter land or one herborg in order yeah. to make that happen. She does not. She has no ability to make black mana, so she's not gonna be casting the black creatures unless maybe Raja or maybe your opponent not in this case, but maybe your opponent throws out an herborg once in a while. <laughs> not here. helps you out a little bit sure sure i mean i've heard i've heard many living in players complain because you know some of your hands are functioning on very low lands when you draw that herborg or that filter land it's really bad mm -hmm. and so zoe you know choosing to have more functional hands but less you know a ability to just fire off the the black creatures cast mode thinking that equity is a little bit more worth it as teferi coming down on turn three maybe signals that raja did find a green card to pair with the endurances or is just not super worried about you know the graveyard status yet but either way to fair coming down first putting zoe to the test all right you know if this if this one works then your living ends don't and i think we see a subtlety that may be responded to this to fairy with yeah there, there comes is subtlety. A, there is a subtlety is there a capability of living end this turn otherwise it's gonna be tough i don't know there's maybe another street with in hand maybe looking for the the possibility Raja's hand certainly is there has no green card for endurance. I don't so think there maybe is. If Zoe has it here, maybe we could just have a living end right now. Well, we don't have uh we do have red mana, but Zoe does not appear to have a cascade spell yet. So this draw step finds one. Did not. No. Okay. Well, I think if you're Raja, you have to be pumping your fists on yeah. that. 
certainly. And another Teferi drawn. Two Teferis in hand alongside the Endurance. Well, I think that's the same uh, endurance? one. Endurance? No, I think there's two. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I mean, that's the same one that was. Uh, oh, sure, that was redrawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah but there's still, there's still yes, two there are, Teferis yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. And Zoe's going to have to answer. Alongside the Endurance, which can also be hard cast, I think this is the part of the game where winning gets hard. Yes. For no, Zoe. We've already reached she the really point. really needed to find that Cascade spell off of that cycle mm -hmm. or the draw step. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you just see how how things could work. It, you know, a pitch cast ability to stop the, the initial Planeswalker. And then if Zoe's got, you know, the, the business here on turn three, then she floods the board. Uh Unfortunately for her, it's not present. So Raj is able to deploy here. And now we need to think through, all right, what's, it was Teferi last turn. It's, is it Teferi again? And now it doesn't look like it was. That was oh, a hand wow. gesture. And if you're Zoe, that has to be red flags. Teferi is yeah. one of the best cards in the matchup. And she just had to two for one herself to get it off the table. And Raj doesn't deploy it at all. And with the stop here, I think we're going to be proactively going for endurance. Interesting. So this would be vulnerable to, if... Well, okay, so what are the chances that Zoe has Von Operas that did not play it at any point? Right, I, I think yeah, that, those chances basically are basically zero, zero right. right? Yeah, so yeah. Raja knows there's no Cascade that's going to happen in response, which is why we're doing it on upkeep, Raja being very proactive about it. And the, the good thing about this endurance is it, it is able to start going to work immediately as mm -hmm. far as doing damage, right? Like, we are, talked last game about how Zoe can just start casting these monsters eventually if you just do nothing, and we'll eventually win via that way. So Raja, under some pressure to actually put pressure on Zoe's life total. Yeah, so, okay, the draw there might have been Mystical Dispute for Zoe, which is great for stopping the first Teferi. Sure. But unfortunately for her, there are two, if that even was the draw. But Courier Mysteries in hand, not cast. So, yeah, I think it is a dispute. But, yeah, this Endurance will just start cracking away. And Spar's headquarters fetched three different Triumphs the, in play. The uh, Leyline Binding is going to be worth one mana for the rest of the game, I believe. Odawara in hand alongside Jace and plenty of other options. Not as flooded this game is Raja Suleiman as, I believe, a Teferi being reached for. I mean, he's sure flooded is. on Planeswalkers. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think that's the one you'd much rather be flooded on in this particular scenario. And that one's going to answer, be answered with a mystical dispute. Endurance laying the smack down. All right, so... Uh, Zoe does have Waker of Waves and Striper of Riverwind. So a cycle, I mean, a finding, finding Cascade spell here would, you know, would has does have potential. Yeah, it, it could be really good actually. I mean, the Teferi answered for the moment, and Zoe is going to be able to put at least two creatures in graveyard this turn. We see uh, Curator of Mysteries. I think we're going to cycle that one as well. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and crack life total getting a little concerning going down to 12 but not quite enough to be relevant just yet yeah and on honestly if if she manages to get off a living end then her life total is probably going to be fairly well protected and if she doesn't she's dead anyway so i don't know that that's a prime concern here yeah go ahead and shock in a breeding pool and cycle again and see if she can find one of the payoffs I have to wonder here, too, if Raja maybe is going to get a little punished for his aggression. Like, firing off that endurance as proactive as he did is, yeah, it's great for putting pressure on Zoe. We know she didn't have a Cascade spell, so, you know, just getting the graveyard cleared right away. But I think he did that with the expectation that this Teferi would eventually resolve, and mm -hmm. he would have, be able to pass back with both angles checked. You know, pressure on the life total, Teferi to pick up anything, as well as stopping the, the living ends. But with the Teferi not working, there's once again kind of another... Uh, hole for zoe to punch mm -hmm. so so there's two more cyclers in hand i believe yeah, so yeah, yeah i think two street race too so yeah. life total will get real low if we just cycle these we really need to find it here but if she does she's going to be in a commanding position uh, still several still three more cyclers and a land to make them so wow zoe slams oh, the brakes wow. on cycling even before is that i think it's a street race in hand uh maybe you got a little concerned about the life total I, boy. Yeah, concerned about the light total. Zoe also has an Odawara. So if, mm -hmm. if Teferi does end up happening, she can set up a cycle, or like a turn cycle, where she does answer the Teferi uncounterably via mm -hmm. Odawara and yeah. then can go for the living end once again. You know, maybe, and this also checks the aggression on her life total. So if you're concerned about the life total, this does a good job of kind of splitting the difference. Your cyclers from here on out are going to come with a scry and you can get a little bit more selection as far as setting up for maybe multiple living ends in the same turn kind of thing, uh, while still proactively advancing your board state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. This is tough. It, with with the land drop available and another Street Wraith and two Curators, that's three more cards that we could look at for a Cycler, for a Cascader. And 
while maybe that doesn't give you an intense win percentage here, it does give you a reasonable shot. Whereas here, giving Raj another turn. Now, this is kind of the oh, worst wow. possible. Okay, was that a subtlety? She found subtlety. All right, all right. That's okay. Certainly not bad. That's not bad at all. I mean, that gives her another another turn and another opening, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. And she's thinking about it real hard. But I, yeah, I feel like you have to slam this subtlety. You yeah. can't let your, your curator get bounced. You can't let your, your living ends not work. And Raja, I don't think has a, necess a response necessarily. He needs to needs to think about it either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pulling the creatures forward. All right, how much power is the living end if she finds it? It's quite a lot. It's, it's a lot, yeah. It's probably too much to handle with no... Creatures in Raja's graveyard to bring back. Wow. The, yeah, uh, I mean, there's so much that we've been through. I, this is so tough. I mean, the Teferi... <laughs> Raja has put Teferi Time Raveler on the stack. I, I think we're up to three, three four yeah. times. Something like that. And Zoe's done a great job of weathering the storm. And this is why we called out some of the other effects, things like Endurance, Chalice of the Void, a little bit better mm -hmm. uh, against Living End, despite all of them kind of shutting down the strategy entirely. Because Teferi's, you can check those with Mystical Dispute. You can check those with subtleties and stuff like that and have them actually be very effective. Whereas some of the other cards come down earlier and are a little bit harder to line up with these, uh, these responses that Zoe can have. Mm -hmm. So what is Raja... Doing, and I'm curious what Raj is actually information he's trying to understand here. Zoe has one card left in hand. He's trying to figure out, well, if there's a living end, how screwed am I? I mean, that's well, also she like did a cycle of Street Wraith in response to the Teferi, but before yeah. subtletying. So I yeah. think he's kind of trying to derive what that last card in Zoe's hand is and what her plan is based on the previous turn she took, mm -hmm. right? Like we were kind of confused, like, oh yeah, we should just keep going, la da 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 da. And this curator mystery is actually working out fairly well with the subtlety found. Yeah, I, I guess think that's influencing his decision. He's trying, he's trying to, yeah, he's trying to figure out where he wants to put that Teferi top or bottom. He does choose bottom. And puts Zoe dead on the board on one more attack step. And is that a Stripe River Wonder? That's not going to do it, but it'll give her another that's not redraw. Do it. Do uh, it. A redraw, at least one. I think Odawara can bounce endurance, but that's real tough. <laughs> I don't think you want to do that. It could save you. You won't die, but yeah. it's tough. I mean, it could bounce late line. Yeah, that won't work. Yeah, it's just, it's got to be cycle here and hope. So, we, so right. by passing up the opportunity last turn, Zoe basically ended up in the exact same spot anyway. And I believe found a fetch land. So yeah, okay. So fetch land, you're right. Could bounce endurance here. Uh, so Raja bottoming to fairy does make sense. He figures the last and draws his own subtlety. The last turn, he's either going to win here or not. So drawing to fairy isn't going to make any difference either way. And he's probably correct about that. So good decision making. Definitely. And and we mentioned a few times about the endurance play right on upkeep, very proactive, and it's mattering a lot here. And Zoe going to have to actually bounce that one, be able to use it once again, but she does get to live for another turn at the very least. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the very but, least. Yeah. 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 I mean, it still can just be pitched and Raja also has subtlety at the ready, just multiple three power lethal attackers at instant speed. Uh, despite this being way closer, you know, Zoe did a great job of weathering the onslaught of hate cards that Raja has had. I think we're still going to be looking at a game three here, right. provided nothing goes wildly wrong for Raja. Yeah, here. we may just see, yeah, hardcast endurance right now. That seems pretty safe for Raja. Definitely, yeah. I think we do want to just fire it off main phase. There's not, you know, a whole lot of punishment for doing so. Proactively hitting the graveyard is clearly something that Raja's already been very interested in, especially as stacked as it is. And now Zoe's best draw actually involves not just living in, but some cyclers into living in. Yeah, and that's... Tough. Look at what. Okay, she's at two life. Three rates were dead, so it's got to be, you know, two one mana cyclers into living end, and even then, it's not great. It's not great, but she's not. It's not bad either, especially if one of them flies. Like curator yeah. mysteries is an important part of the mix. Let's see what she did find. Four mana. Another curator. Yeah, yeah it's going to be a curator mysteries and subtlety pitch J or leyline binding. Yeah, all of it. Multiple ways to answer just one creature. That's going to bring us to game number three in what was a kind of a nail biter. Yeah, multiple that was, turns Zoe had outs. That was close. That was. Uh, I mean, Zoe had multiple draw steps to hit a cascader, and if she had found one, I think she wins. 
Absolutely. Uh, and this is honestly, this shows not just the skill of Zoe Riederman, which is clearly proven. She's in top four, she's fighting for her spot in the finals, but also the power of this living in deck and how mm-hmm. resilient it is. Multiple times we've been like, yeah, oh, she's in trouble. She's in trouble. Look at all these hate cards that Raja has access to. But Zoe in, in all of the games really has managed to kind of weather those, weather those and put herself in positions to you know, have living in and win the game with it. And I, I think that's really impressive. It speaks to how resilient that living deck, living in deck really is. Yeah, and 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 as for for Raja, um, having built his deck, having having chosen his modern deck, I mean, probably anticipating. You know, this is an event where you you know the field going in, and you're looking at okay, Zoe Ruderman. Even if no one else does, Zoe Ruderman loves playing Living End. I want to make sure I have a shot against it. You know, I want to have my seventy five just packed to the guild with <laughs> yeah. with with cards to make it tougher if we play super rewarder for that playing her in the top four you know trying to get into the finals in a spot where he's got just maybe 10 hate cards with with teferi with chalice with endurance is so much and yet zoe almost got that game like you said it's this is uh yeah all the way through i mean this is uh this is what we're hoping for when we when we set up these tournaments you know we want to have exciting stuff we want to get under the wire and we certainly get paid off here now jesse robkins was me. waiting for a while at this point <laughs> does she and have- i'm sure she's watching this match rooting her friend on it's no secret you know jesse and zoe big you know, friends as many players in this energy championship event are mm-hmm. hard not to become friends when you see each other basically every other weekend or whatever throughout the year playing these NRG series events and, you know, no matter the matchups, I know Jesse's watching and uh, rooting for her friend Zoe. No, no hard feelings to Raja, of course, she, but they are maybe, they're very you close. Know, you don't know that. Maybe she's thinking, I, do know that. I don't want to have to beat my friend in the finals. I'd rather she lose now. <laughs> it could be. It could be. That's that's one way of looking at it. Joe, I think you're one of the only people that what looks are you talking at about? these I'm strange trying, angles. I, I don't want my friend just to have – your friends, Joe. It's I'm, okay. I'm just saying. Okay, so but as far as – okay, for Jesse Robkin, sure, loyalty to your friends is one thing. I'm sure she's – uh, well, we know she's close with both of them, probably. True. As far as just how does she rate her chances against each of these matchups? So um, Raja is playing black. So it's black, red, or green in Pioneer. And, so, and uh, Jesse's playing mono white. Uh, I think we'd probably rather play against green. I think so by quite a bit. <laughs> okay. And then in modern, we have Team or Breach versus either Living End or um the the control deck the control deck yeah so i think you're more ready to play against living in still I think, I, you know i haven't reviewed exactly how much hate she has but we do know she has like a tormod script that you can find with things like saga mm-hmm. has access to a lot of different counter spells and stuff like that uh, especially cheap counter spells which are the ones you want against right. living in so i i think both decks you know whatever they're probably about the same as far as win percentage wise but oh. overall i think living in's the one you're maybe a little bit more yeah. excited to play against. also either way we got yeah. an update from matt that uh, Jesse, who worked with Andrew Ellen Bogan and actually clean sweep defeated him to make earn her spot in the finals, is actually reviewing the matchups for both players right sure. now. I mean, yeah, uh, as we speak with her her downtime, a very smart use of that mm-hmm. time. Uh, and Andrew and Jesse, you asked, you know, how far does that team and go? Well, clearly very far. Now that Andrew's eliminated, no hard feelings. Let's get you prepared for the finals. Yeah, no, and I think uh, I think another thing to to consider as far as the modern matchup would go is that Zoe's deck can do exactly what she wants and jesse the team of reach that could still win right so yeah like you put all these creatures in play all yeah. right good for you untap underworld breach right. kill you yeah you know, it's not a creature based strategy yeah so i think uh, i think jesse would probably prefer zoe win whether the friendship loyalty on matchups is, when, when, <laughs> yeah on matchups yeah and like uh i know um you know back you know it's been a while now but in the in the, in the players championship that i won uh, six years ago now, which is amazing. I think it was that long ago. Uh, right, I certainly had my eye on on all the matchups for the formats. You know, looking at like what the potential opponents could be and everything. And um, yeah, so that's something that's. I mean, it's a lot of you know counterplay, this and that, this matchup, this format, you know, whatever. But like, it's something that when you're and you're there, especially when you're waiting, you got to think about something right now. It's it's hard to just tune yourself out entirely. Maybe some people are able to do that. I don't know that I am. And so, yeah, you're you're probably obsessing over like what matchups, how do I sideboard against, even if you know the matchups intimately, you're still thinking, did I miss anything? Does this specific list change anything? I've got an hour here. It turns out may as well spend it getting ready for the finals. But whoever wins this match, in fact, whoever wins this game, Jesse Rodkin yeah. is waiting in the finals. 
final game, final match, a lot on the line. And yeah. one thing, if we were talking about decks that I think is consistent across the final three competitors in our championship event is they played the decks that they are best with the decks that they were the most successful with. Mm -hmm. And they, they showed up with two versions. Yeah. A little bit of sideboard changes and stuff like that. And it, I think Jesse before the event even called out that she has a blank rest in peace in her <laughs> sideboard of her pioneer deck. Cause it's good against nobody, mm -hmm. but you know, covered all the angles, hedged a little bit, but for the most part, nobody made any wild metagame calls and succeeded at a high level. Yeah. Everyone's still in competition showed up with the decks that they are the most proficient with and have played tight magic, just good execution across the board and have, you know, earned not just a lot of money, but a chance at winning the whole tournament here right now. Yeah, absolutely. And as players are getting ready to present, yeah, you know, Jesse Robkin, don't feel bad about having a dead card in your in your sideboard, though. That happens. I mean, I went through one of the players' championships, Tom Ross and buddies, all gonna play Infect. I played three submerges, Drake Sasser. Nobody played Infect. <laughs> there was none uh, in the tournament. <laughs> That's that's tough, but that's th three submerges. Three blanks is a lot worse than one. Yeah, that's, yeah. So that's tough. You know, one recipe. I wouldn't feel too bad about that if I was Jesse. All right, here we go. Game three, match number three. Zoe Ruderman on the play, or at least with priority. Presumably yeah, choosing your go first. Go. Looking at opening hands, it, Zoe. I think. I mean, she she put up a good fight last game, and I think she's in a lot better shape in game number three here. And I think Raja looking at a pile of lands, chalice and endurance. If that's not it, I'm not sure what is, but is a little bit at risk of just having the chalice forced and dying on turn three. Right. I mean, conceivably the, or griefed anything. Yeah. I mean, well, that's true also. Yeah. I mean, it's nice that having chalice is so good because all his other things basically cost three and well, there's a grief. Okay. Oh no, this is a disaster <laughs> for Raja. And so he's a force too. A lot of curiosity. So he has oh, a she has it all? Well, I'm dialed she has up. Yeah, I can answer everything. What you got, Mr. Raja? <laughs> she does have a blue card. It might be a Charlotte's agent, though. She might have another Cascader. I think she's going to – okay, she's going to take Endurance. So leaving Chalice for Raja. Okay, well, no secrets there. And, in fact, no thing, nothing that costs mana. He's going to start turn <laughs> one with no cards in his hand that cost mana. Roger, a ton of mana, nothing that costs it. Yeah. So not a great spot to be in. Like I said, this is the risk of keeping him like this. Yeah, you've got a few hate cards, but you know this Libyan deck gets to stay around because it is so good against these hate cards. Chalice, a counterspell to draw, that could okay. be a really big one yeah, for certainly. Raja, especially now that Zoe does not know about it. Mm -hmm. Chalice, not played. Well, it, I mean, Zoe's not cascading this turn anyway, but although if, oh. she, if she griefed again, then it would look pretty embarrassing, but okay. Here we go. And Zoe, actually, I'm not sure there's even cyclers in hand. So, yeah, I don't think there is. It would like the, I would assume that we're looking at a potential, uh, just like shored up cascade where you just really get your Charlotte's agent and your grief back and kind of do like we did game one, where if that's not good enough, whatever, I'll start casting the big creatures. We if it that? is, well, okay, great, you're dead. I mean, we, we can do that. Charlotte's agent grief versus endurance. I don't know. I mean, it, grief. Has yeah, yeah. Menace. It, it, I know, but still, you're, you're, yeah, you can race, but like that's, I, I think, oh boy, I think we need a lot more than that. At least one additional creature. Uh, and Zoe doesn't Maybe currently so. have that. Yeah, I don't know that we're in a spot where this actually might work out in Zoe's favor since she has no Raja Druid counter spell that she may not cascade on turn three, even if she can, because there's not enough stuff. Right. And, you know, Raja definitely, I think, held this Chalice in part to hold up Counterspell. Like, now we can go into turn two, cast Chalice, and then if, you know, there's a fight, maybe you can Counterspell protect it a little bit. But I think Zoe just flushed with answers. I think there's, like, a Beseju. Mm -hmm. I think there's Notawara. They're just like, we got answers to the hate. And just trusting the top of her library to give her all of the pieces she needs to win the game. Uh, things like Cyclers, of course, into, you know, Living. And another Grief picked up i don't think we have a black card for that one odawara deployed as the third land yeah i i think this is okay so we might be in hard cast Solitude. Yeah. <laughs> both players have no relevant cards they can deploy right now yeah this they, is they, really strange right i feel like we've seen this before both cards just both decks just kind of on their c minus draws yeah there's is that a waker of waves that would be a big pickup for zoe to get the graveyard going well, you don't really want to play this procedure, right? There's a face-up Chalice of the Void. You need to get off the right. table. You have an answer to that, but you kind of also want to hit your land drops. Do you main phase this Waker Waves as a result? That's what she's going to do. You might want to leave the green on tap, though. And, yep. 
Uh, just wait. Just wait on okay. it entirely. And I don't hate this, too, yeah. actually. You know, you're in no rush. And if you get to hard cast the Force of Negation, yeah. that's actually pretty nice. Yeah. Like, if something like Teferi's coming down, you know, Force of Negation that. And then, you know, you're just kind of trading a little bit on resources. That way you're not hemorrhaging all your resources just trying to answer the hate pieces. You get to answer them as they come. And, you know, still be able to execute your plan at a later date. Okay, so Raja, yeah, fetching a land out. Seeing the deck may not be worth much, but he'll take it because he doesn't need any more lands right now. Dovin's Veto. Dovin's that Veto. That's a relevant yeah. pickup. Mm -hmm. Counterspell and Dovin's Veto going to be available for Raja as he just passes the turn back. That does allow Zoe to use her mana, though. His Waker of Waves is going to get cycled here. One on top, one to the graveyard. Can't counter that. It is an activated ability. All right, so just looking for bodies in the graveyard. Although Waker of Waves is a pretty big one, it's so big. Oh, it's and, and honestly, like something like another black card yeah. would be excellent as well. You know, just being able to start firing up the 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 second grief and clear the way. There's there's a lot that Zoe can assemble, and it's very much like there's no pressure. Like we saw in game number one, uh, or I'm sorry, in game number two, where Roger just ran out the endurance, respecting the fact he needs to put pressure on Zoe's life total, or she will amass enough resources to beat all of the hate. She is more mana efficient than Raja is. I think we're kind of in that same spot. Like Raja is ahead. He's got counter spells. He's got a lot covered. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we may see something like a, a solitude cast just for, for five mana. Here's a three-two that can start attacking. We really need to get to work. Otherwise, Zoe's gonna build up enough resources to power through the counter spells and the permanent based hate. Maybe. Maybe I mean that is I mean, I don't know, it's to me because of Violent Outburst. As long well, until once the chalice is off the board, Raja's probably gonna be fairly uh frightened of tapping out fairly reticent to tap out but while it's there he does have some protection but even now uh yeah i don't know i don't see the real well that doesn't actually help <laughs> I, I, Chalice, I, yeah. Chalice zero number two doesn't do what you want it to no, do it that's not. not gonna go your way yeah that's a pretty amusing one lots of hate cards double up they're they're it's great chalice not so much I don't think there's a universe you want to put it on something higher, like two or three or whatever, because then some of your cards start not working. Uh, right. So no. probably just going to hold that one. Yeah. But that does mean if Zoe tries to blow up the Chalice and then cannot actually penetrate Raja's defenses, then he can redeploy the other Chalice and she'll then need to find the answer. And there's the Kahira. And even though that's All right. not relevant right now, here, okay, there goes the Chalice. Zoe does make a move. Mm-hmm. Going to blow up that chalice. Now, this does allow Raja to grab any land with a land type, which could represent untapped mana. Yeah. Yeah. I that that is, I mean, most of the counters cost two or three. So that's not gonna probably make Zoe shy away. I think this is any more hard to get through than it would be otherwise. And she'd be correct on that, unless there is an endurance, which gets turned on. Endurance, Archmage's Charm, probably the, the mm -hmm. two she's thinking about. The fact it's entering taps, maybe just a great sign for Zoe. But, yeah. you know, we do know that Raja has Dovin's Veto, has Counterspell. So no matter what, it's going to have both of those Counterspells represented as Raja rethinks his Lambda selection here. And it's Hollow Fountain instead. All right. So Zoe does have the another Living End in hand. So this grief, second grief is castable. But yeah, as we know, that's not going to be enough. And it's dead silent in the room at Nerd Rage Gaming. There's a lot on the line. Game number three, match number three. We move into Zoe, untapping three mana. It's enough for a living end. Grief coming down, exiling the living end she drew. Not probably going to like what she sees at all. No, we'll see it, exactly how she navigates this. You know, she might have to take the chalice here. Yeah, because she has multiple Charlotte's agents, and only one living end's gone. So maybe we can start to power through these counters. I think two living ends are gone. I think I think two have been pitched to Grief. No, we don't know whether yeah, she... I didn't see what was pitched the first yeah, brief. If the think... second one's gone, you know, we <laughs> I don't think we can do both yeah. shardless agents. We're gonna have to find some help. Maybe we can get confirmation from the table, but I think Living In was pitched to both griefs. So yeah, Raja thinking this over here, he's gonna I, I like no move. Yeah, let I it like resolve. No and he's got uh, well we can see here Island, Chalice, Dovin's Veto, Counterspell, Kahira, Solitude. And for Zoe, this has to be a little heartbreaking. You're thinking I have a good chance here. I'll take the counter, whatever it is, and I will put somewhere in the neighborhood 15 power on the board and then take two more cards. And that's not going to happen. So so does, does the plan now then become take the chalice, right? And then play the first... No, because if you play the first one, he gets a counter spell and yeah. then it just works. You need to draw a violent outburst so that the force works. But even You're then, when, when Raja untaps, I mean, he's never going to. 
Yeah, you need to line up the Force of Negation with one of the counter spells. Yeah. A Living End with the other one of the counter spells, and then untap and Shardless Agent. That's yeah. kind of the sequence she needs to assemble from what we know right now. This is, with, with you know, a half a dozen Living Ends in the deck, this would be, maybe she could fight through this eventually by taking the Chalice. But since that's obviously not the case, there's at most two more. Unless she brought yeah, in her she's, own, she's doing math now. This, this is, is so tough. This is very hard. It's it's hard to see a way through, no matter what you do. So in that scenario, you just have to do the you know. Okay, what if you take one of the counter spells? Plan to force of negation. Take like Dovid's veto. Plan to force of negation the chalice that sure. gets counter spelled. Yeah, and then and you then, can try to draw one of your removal spells yeah. instead. Yeah, and at least Raj is out. At least Raj is out of stuff at that point. Uh, I like right. that. I, 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 I'm with you on that. I, that seems, that seems like the way to go. It, it's really tough. The Dovin's veto is such a problem. I think yeah. that may be selected. Yeah, she actually arrives at that conclusion as well. I, okay. I like that a lot. Yeah, the Dovin's veto is a huge problem. Yeah, good for her. Okay. Two living ends exiled. Yeah, there are two living ends gone. Okay, so we do know there was, uh, there was a fourth one in the cyborg, right? Correct. And that yeah. one always gets boarded against the control deck. So I think we can safely assume there are four in Zoe Reader instead. Okay. All right. So, well, I think she's got to go shardless now, right? If, you uh, know what? I'm this is sure you can, right? I think you have to pass. Why? That way, because you have to maintain your living in count in your deck, I think. So, you know, Raja, what? very likely to go Chalice here. You force, it gets counterspelled. You have to draw a single removal spell, which will be uncounterable via likely Odawara's what, what, what have you. If, if, if Zoe goes Shardless now, Raja okay. has to counter. Then he goes Chalice, right. she forces the Chalice. Raja's out of everything. Well, her has... last card in hand is her last living in. She's, she's, she is out of gas. No, if there's no, she has two sharp. Oh, there's a right stripe river. Yeah. Right? Okay. Okay. No, I think if it's if it's if it's if if the play is shardless, Raja has to counter. He has no choice. She passes. He plays chalice. She pitch cast force pitch the river winder. Raja's done out of stuff. She untaps plays the other shardless. I think that might have been the way. Oh, she's gonna go for hard cast force. Okay. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I wanted to okay. hard cast force, maintain the cards in hand, and then use the stripe river winder to find things. But I think you might have been right. Yeah, I, I think don't... you might have been right that it might be a little bit more equity but zoe seems to be thinking about something else maybe the solitude or whatever throws a little bit of a maybe i mean there's, there's, i mean there, raj has got so many cards in hand there's a lot of factors to consider here right and raj is not even sure what to do here so yeah this is this is tough yeah he's not even sure if he's supposed to use the counter spell yeah yeah right. wow this no, is he's tough. not sure yeah we right. have all the information yeah. roger does not and has well, to try to derive we're not sure with zoe's we know hand. everything and we're not even sure what to do but yeah, yeah so i think uh if i'm if i'm putting this together in my mind correctly if if she goes for shardless last turn Although it does require her to have boarded the other living end, which you think she did, um, right? Then it doesn't require her to draw anything else. She has everything she needs. Now with Chalice on the board, now she needs the deck to be you know considerate to her. Stripe River Wire to the draw. I think that's actually a draw she's fairly happy with, given that sure. she most likely just wants to spend her time uh, looking at new cards until yeah. she finds a removal spell. Yeah. Gonna start with a cycle, I'm sure. Land drop she can play, otherwise, you know, whatever, no harm, no foul. Another cycler picked up. We'll see if she's interested yeah. in cycling anymore. I don't see why not. Be, yes. Another card picked up. Is okay, that that's, yeah, it is. Well, that'll do it, huh? Yeah, it will. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, so now do you cycle again? Hope to hit a land drop. I think you do. I think so. Because yeah, you, think if you, you hit if you hit two lands in a row, then you can go, then you can do, do it all. Oh turn. my gosh. Right. But we missed. Yeah, we missed. But we get we to found... try every turn for the rest of the game. So if this Foundation Breaker resolves, we yeah. get to just try, like, basically every turn for the rest of the game. But Jace, the Mind Sculptor, the draw for Raja Suleiman, and yeah. that's going to be a big problem if he decides to cast that one, looking for some more help. And things we... like Endurance, all those kinds of things that you could find off the top of the library, suddenly available draws off that Brainstorm ability from the powerful Planeswalker. Yeah, and with Teferi also being three man, I mean, with three man available, everything is live here for Raja. Jace, the Mind Sculptor. All right, gonna Brainstorm. Let's see what he finds. Oh, Endurance, Broken okay. Charm. So a green card to pitch. Solitude's still available. That's a lot of help from Jace the Mind Sculptor. It sure is. Okay. Oh, wow. So Raja, I mean, probably a little nervous there with just the Chalice and no counter magic in the hand. Finds the Jace. Now he's got his hand stocked up. Uh, probably breathes a... Endurance available. Yeah, probably breathes a sigh of relief here. 
You can use Broker's Charm to power through the two cards on the top of the library if he decides to uh, pitch cast Endurance, exiling the Kahira. There are a lot of different sequences available, given that Zoe may uh, try something next turn, as he thinks pretty hard on the last two cards on Brainstorm. Notably, one of the harder facts to resolve, you have done it many times in your life. I'm sure have spent plenty of time thinking on your Brainstorm selections dude what do, do, I, my reputation as far as i remember was that i was a lightning fast player who made all my decisions instantly <laughs> do, do you did you he hear says, differently uh you know i mean a little bird if you will <laughs> violet outburst a pickup for zoe readerman all foundation right. breaker coming down that one won't be answered by the counter spell that we know of i don't think we saw any in raja's hand so that one's gonna work We're doing, thinking about the responses. No response. Ooh, okay. Still thinking. Yeah, that one's going to get to take care of. Yeah, I wonder if he's thinking so, about, do I have to endurance in response? But, but he doesn't. He realizes that because Zoe doesn't have three mana available anymore. So now he's just going to throw it out at the end of the turn, get rid of her graveyard. And another proactive endurance from Raja. I like mm -hmm. this a lot. Zoe's still at too. a very healthy 20. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being able to start getting this game over with is what Raja needs. Zoe's done a great job of managing the hate pieces. He needs to close the door on this game. Mm -hmm. Well, Kahira is, you know, helps in that. That would increase the clock significantly. Endurance talking for three right now. And then with Jason on the board is the big thing. So does Raja have enough here to just... Does he need to brainstorm again? Can he scry? Can he? He's probably not going to fade still. So he has too many unknown cards. So that wouldn't be right. effective. You could Broker's Charm before brainstorming. We do know the top card. Mm -hmm. You can also just do it in the other order. There's a lot to consider as far as sequencing your cards to see the, see the most cards versus half more mana up. Mm hmm. We do know that Raja kind of low on interaction. Oh, so he doesn't have a graveyard at all. And he chooses to pick up endurance with mm -hmm. Jace. So that's probably just the best thing you could possibly do, huh? Right. Yeah, that's nice. So wow. now this probably up play. Yeah, that's nice. So this probably means that he's gonna hard cast solitude at the end of her turn. I would imagine to continue having attackers on the board. Because you do want to have a clock. So he finally draws a fourth land. Um is it just is it just shardless agent time? Put pressure on the Jace. It seems like it is. I don't think that mana works. I think we need it to tap differently there. Yeah, small mana adjustment needed there. No green mana was tapped, but doesn't really matter. I don't think she has yeah. anything going on for one mana. No. And this Livian almost certainly not going to be cast. There's literally no reason to do so. Literally just a gray ogre to pressure Jace the Mind Sculptor, and maybe try to make Raja redeploy something. Yeah. Be it endurance, Kahira, whatever. All right, so um, if we can radio over to the table and have them uh, fix adjust her mana there, as this is while we're, there while we we're resolving go. this we're, cascade, we're over it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if you uh, if you are here and you're watching Energy for the first time, thank you very much for being here. We bring you Preper Magic coverage definitely monthly, sometimes you know multiple weeks in a month. And if you want to see that, get notified when we are live, please. Hit that follow button. Hit that subscribe. Of course, we'll clear that the ads out the way. Can't really control those too, too much. But uh, also help support the channel. Please follow, subscribe, support Paper Magic coverage. There's a you know really depressing lack of it, I think, uh, compared to what we've had in the past. And Energy puts on a great show here. And I'm here to tell you right now, this is some great Paper Magic coverage we're seeing as well. Tight play from both players in a really tight spot. You know, game game three, match three. It's all on the line. Thousands of dollars these players are playing for. And uh, you, you really can't get this anywhere else right now. So please hit that follow button, support us, support NRG and everything they do. And uh, we appreciate your support and appreciate you being here, if nothing else. And the re-invite too. I mean, playing for, the, like we talked about this earlier, playing for the money is great. Playing for the re-invite to next year's championship. I know Ivan Espinosa very much enjoyed having the free ride back to the event this year. All right. So there is the Solitude cast, takes out the Stratos agent. Uh, Raja Suleiman will yeah. continue the aggression and... Take a look oh, at some cards. Wow. It's another Jason endurance. Jason Mind Sculptor. Yeah. Jason Mind Sculptor really kind of showing why it was once called better than all. I'm not sure that that's true anymore, but certainly still extremely powerful. Finding help, counterspell, endurance, now among other cards that Raja can cast. And it's kind of on the comeback, right? It's, mana. it's, it's kind of, Certainly. Jace on the comeback. I feel like I've seen more Jace in Modern in the last month than I did in the previous 10 months. Uh, it's it's fair enough. I don't know how much that's hopium because you like the card a lot. So, yeah, I know, you know, but I still don't see enough. <laughs> I think you just watch a lot of energy. There's a lot I of control decks. I don't see enough plusing of Jace though. I got to say, minusing, bouncing your own uh, endurance though. That that's nice. I I uh, I'm in favor of that. That's a nice play. Jace bouncing your own and this stuff. This is tough is here. Cool. Speaking of, you yeah, know, this is Raja putting pressure on Zoe's life total, but literally here once again can just pick up uh, the 
the solitude and just yeah. redeploy that exiling the curator of mysteries and basically undoing zoe's entire turn mm -hmm. and you know with a planeswalker that still just gets to you know wants to be in play turn after turn keep getting advantage it's just a really tough spot for zoe to, to, to be yeah. in she's gonna need to assemble uh some living end with backup fast yeah and and she, and she's she has to start at the beginning there's not even a graveyard right now and raj is just going to accumulate more counters now zoe knows there's no more chalice left there's only two they're both gone so she doesn't have to worry about that anymore but there are four are there's still four terry fairy time lovers in the deck i think there are i don't think we've seen one yet i think so yeah i don't think we've seen any of those yet as yeah. endurance added to the mix and now a real attack force actually being assembled mm -hmm. here i mean and maybe we just down take jace play kahira we can start laying the smack down and putting jo zoe dead in two turns yeah yeah that certainly seems like an option on the table and holding up one counter is probably sufficient for raja because even if zoe resolves to living in right now what does he care there's no graveyard yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing to go in place. So Zoe likely going to have to do some cycling, if for nothing else, than to get creatures in the yard to get Living in started mm -hmm. to begin with. And and we might even just be approaching Living in just to clear the board. You don't yeah. see that happen too much anymore. But, yeah, I mean, definitely getting there. And two more counter spells okay. to Fairy picked up. Jace the Mind Sculptor showing really how powerful it is. It takes over this game, and I think that may just be the door on everything. Yeah, and, and Raj also showing, like, I mean, there's a reason why he put his – this matchup favored him. We knew that going in. Uh, he did drop the first game, but looking strong here, looking poised to head towards the finals. Zoe Reedman, incredible run here. Top four, very impressive in this field, but it's looking like she's going to come up one game shy of the finals. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's still an incredibly impressive run from Zoe Reederman finding herself here in the stage four, the top four, and brought it down to a single game. And there was multiple spots throughout this match. If she had drawn, you know, maybe a little bit differently with, you know, the yeah. top of the deck, you know, she maybe could have put herself in a spot. That's part of the game of Magic the Gathering. Raja also has had some pretty bad draw steps across some of the games. Either way, both these players have played some of the best Magic I'm sure they have ever played across the course of this tournament and have been very handsomely rewarded for their play and their resiliency in this performance and that endurance there alongside a bounce with the Kahira appears to be more than enough. And yeah, Raja yeah. explaining that players shake hands. Raja is your second finalist, Jesse Robkin waiting for him to arrive. And we are going to see, I mean, a lot of commentators picked Raja to win this one. And, mm -hmm. you know, we had Mason picking Jesse to win this one. A lot of commentators still in the running to be right as oh. we get our finals prepared. Yeah, I'm sorry. Not all, them, not all of them. Not all of them. All right. So uh, we talked a few minutes. Oh, actually, when we were killing time during sideboarding, we talked about Jesse's preferred opponents. Opponents, we thought she probably had an easier, she had an advantage against Zoe, maybe not so much against Raja. It is going to be Jesse Robkin and Raja Sullivan playing for the Energy 2022 Championship title. We'll be back in three minutes to the finals. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 